Chapter 1 Prologue He ignored the blaring alarms and the blinking lights from the many machines around the room. He kept his eyes on the sizable ceiling-to-floor screen setup, displaying the skyline of a large metropolitan city. The door behind him would occasionally open with a soft hiss, and another person would quietly join him. Some stood, while others sat down in their seats until the room filled with all thirteen of them. He never turned to look at them, and neither did they say a word as they joined him in watching the screens. This is getting out of hand. We must do something, one of the figures shrouded in shadows said, her voice female but giving no further hint of her identity. He slowly nodded in agreement, and he imagined many of the others did the same. Indeed, we will have to act this time he said calmly after a short pause. We will have to be careful with what we do, lest we invite greater problems our way. Another shadow spoke up, this voice muffled by something, to make it impossible to recognize it. The words caused a low murmur to spread around the room, as others either agreed with the owner of the voice, or gently disagreed. The first person in the room took a moment to glance around the room, before speaking. We have to show a certain level of strength, yet not too much. At the same time, we have to ensure those not meant to see remains ignorant, he said, to the approval of the rest of them. They might fight over many different things in their normal day-to-day -day dealings, such as to be expected from an organization their size. Yet when things were dire, they would put their differences aside and deal with the issues quickly before going back to fighting over resources and their visions. He moved his hand around in front of him as if tapping on an invisible keyboard, and small windows popped up on the screen. I have already moved extra personnel over, including some of our more elite mobile task forces, he said before a female voice interrupted him. Some of which are under my command, 051. I would prefer that you didn't order my forces around like that, the woman said as she turned to look at him with an angry glare. Others also joined in with much the same criticizing him for taking command of their forces like that. He raised his hands as if to apologize, but before he could say anything, a profound change happened on the large screen, and bright red alarm lights illuminated the otherwise dim room as loud alarms blared inside the room. On the screen, a vast pitch-black rift had opened up, showing the darkness of the universe in daylight before tiny objects started to fly through the rift. Not good, he shouted, and turned his focus onto the screens again. Damn, this is far too large an event to ignore, another voice shouted. We must act at once and with extreme force to deal with this, another stern voice said. He nodded his head and moved his hands again. I call for a vote to block off the city, no signals going in or coming out, a full lockdown. 052 in agreement, 053 in agreement, 054 in agreement, 055 in agreement. 056 in agreement, 057 in agreement, 058 in agreement, 059 in agreement, 0510 in agreement, 0511 in agreement, 0512 in agreement, 0513 in agreement. Vote passed, New York is going dark, 051 said, and with a push of an invisible button, the whole of New York City went into total electronic isolation. At this point, most people in the city hadn't even noticed the massive portal above their heads or the alien invasion happening right now. However, they quickly noticed their phones, televisions, radios, and computers stopped working simultaneously. This caused widespread chaos as all communication died. Calls for help, 911, or other official lines to the military went dead. The EMP burst was unforgiving, lives would be lost due to it, but it was a sacrifice worth making. At once, the entire world was forced into complete ignorance of the fact that an alien invasion was happening in one of the biggest and busiest cities east in the world. Even organizations that might have been able to help, such as the U.S. military, or SHLD, were now blind. Even satellites refused to show anything from the blocked-off area. They all stood there, looking on in silence for a few moments. Yet it didn't take long before pop-ups started flooding in from their agents around the world, who had now been alerted to what was happening. We will have to employ amnestics on everyone in the city that will take a good bite out of our current reserves. The voice of 5-8 sounded out. Everyone quickly agreed on this. 
He also knew how much it would take to affect a city of this size, so he quickly spoke up. Indeed, we must deal with this whole affair as quickly as possible to limit the amount of memories we need to deal with. He said, as he already ran the calculations in his head for how long they had before they would have to go to more extreme lengths to stop the spread of information. He quickly shared his plan of action with them, letting them know what the objectives were and how to best achieve them quickly, including his plan for the aftermath, which really just boiled down to blaming others for the destruction and employing a few objects from containment to clean up the invaders and their tech. As time was of the essence here, he was able to quickly force the others to agree to his plan of action and gave the green light to the agents sitting ready. The plan was ready, the objective clear, to secure, contain, protect. Chapter 2. Marvelous Challenges 1. A sudden wave of nausea overwhelmed Alex, forcing him to clutch the wall for support. His head spun wildly, a silent question throbbing in his mind. What just happened? He whispered as discomfort engulfed him, intensifying with each heartbeat. He spent a few agonizing minutes gasping for air, his back pressed against the cold wall, seeking solace in its stability. With each deep, deliberate breath, the fog in his mind began to clear. But clarity did not bring comfort. Confusion merely deepened as he realized two unsettling truths. Not only had he not been standing here moments ago, but the stark, steel-clad room with its imposing computer system sprawling across the wall was utterly foreign to him. Could this be reincarnation? Transmigration? The word slipped from his lips, a whisper lost in the vastness of the unfamiliar space. Memories bubbled to the surface, alien yet strangely personal, painting a picture of a reality he couldn't reconcile with. He stood in a high-tech command center, a secret bunker as alien to him as the name now attached to his identity, Alexander Ritchie. This name and the memories it brought with it suggested a life of wealth and power. Parts of his memories belonged to a charismatic Italian crime lord, something that clashed violently with his sense of self. He couldn't help but feel that he was very distant from such descriptors. Focus, Alex. Focus. What's the last thing you remember? He urged himself, delving into the chaotic sea of his fragmented memories. He remembered being called Alex, yet details of his personal history were shrouded in obscurity. Sorting through the jigsaw of his mind, he found more questions than answers. His past life was a tapestry with too many missing threads, though his grasp on the broader world remained intact. His eyes snapped open, his frustration boiling over as he slammed his hands against the cold steel. Damn it, he exclaimed. Memories from both lives began to intertwine, including encounters with notorious figures like Shu Wenwu and Tony Stark. Fuck, I'm actually in the Marvel Universe. All right, I've forgotten a lot. I recall being called Alex, but not much else about myself. Oddly enough, that doesn't scare me as it probably should. Slowly, he began sorting through his memories, sifting through a myriad of gaps in both his old and new, though the former were notably more elusive. His past life felt like a distant enigma, with only fragments surfacing amidst a sea of unfamiliarity. Despite the uncertainty, he retained a wealth of random general knowledge about the world around him. The revelation was staggering. Fictional characters from his past life were now terrifyingly real. Okay, deep breaths. Think, think he muttered. I'm in the MCU, apparently playing the villain's role in this world. What does that mean for me? Overwhelmed, Alex considered the implications of his past in this world and the chaos yet to unfold in the future. He doubted his past deeds would spare him from Thanos's impending snap. Yeah, fat chance his karma would put him among the lucky 50%. As he paced, the new memories slowly started to become clearer. Let's break this down. I'm a New York-based crime lord in the Marvel Universe, though my power seemed far beyond the likes of Fisk. He pondered his next moves. Even if I don't need to worry about him, New York isn't the best place to hang out in this world. What about relocating to Italy? No, it's too risky. Such a sudden major move would expose vulnerabilities unbecoming of a crime lord, no point escaping death by alien to instead die by mutiny. Alex also grappled with another puzzling inconsistency. How old am I exactly? His memories suggested a lengthy criminal career, spanning decades, if not far longer than that. Yet his reflection in the blank monitor showed a handsome man in his mid-twenties, 
How is this possible? Sure, the MCU has its means, but I don't recall using any. What's missing from this puzzle? His confusion deepened as he contemplated the out, the disjointed nature of his memories and the reality before him. There were glaring gaps in his understanding, pieces that didn't fit neatly into the narrative of his past. The world he now inhabited felt simultaneously familiar in its grandeur and alien in its finer details. Alex understood the importance of proceeding cautiously, meticulously assembling the fragments of his dual existence to navigate this perplexing new reality. Ding, congratulations to Host for successfully transmigrating into a new and exciting universe. Startled by the sudden sound, Alex nearly jumped. The dead silence of his bunker was abruptly shattered by a disembodied voice accompanied by a semi-transparent blue UI floating before his eyes. A system, huh? Alex muttered, his thoughts racing as he considered the chaotic and perilous nature of the MCU. In a world as dangerous as this, a survival and growth aid is more than welcome, he concluded, acknowledging the stark reality of life in a universe where even the slightest misstep could lead to a premature demise, especially without the protective shield of plot armor. All right, this might not be so bad, Alex thought, contemplating the dangers of the MCU. It's perilous but far from the worst. Plus, it offers opportunities to gain powers, opportunities I can exploit with my knowledge of the future. With a sense of anticipation, Alex sat in the lone chair in front of the computer system, noting its comfort. All right, system, show me what you've got, he exclaimed, his excitement mounting as he envisioned the system's potential powers and advantages. Ding, congratulations to Host for acquiring the SCP system. This system will aid Host in bringing SCP objects into the new universe, facilitating Host's growth in power. Alex's initial excitement quickly gave way to shock and apprehension as the system revealed its purpose and capabilities. Ding! The system allows the host to transport random SCP objects into this universe. By doing so, the host can lock additional resources from the Foundation to assist in containing SCP objects. System, is it restricted to only summoning random SCPs? Alex asked nervously, well aware of the potential dangers associated with many SCPs, particularly those best avoided by anyone of sound mind. Ding, yes, host. All SCP objects summoned will be entirely random. The system responded with its cold, detached voice as if its words wouldn't instill terror in any who understood what it meant. Thanks, but no thanks, Alex quickly retorted, deciding against using the system. The risk of summoning even a single random SCP was too high. While he wasn't an expert on all SCPs, he knew enough to understand that many were far more trouble than they were worth, and a significant portion were world-ending Keter-class threats. Refuse to tangle with those monsters. Perhaps I should pursue magic instead. Magic, after all, has its own allure. Alex began to envision himself wielding various magical powers. However, his thoughts were interrupted by another notification from the system. Ding! Host, please be advised that host is required to bring at least one SCP to the new universe every month or be penalized. Alex's heart sank as the system's warning reverberated in the bunker. What kind of penalties, he asked, his voice laced with apprehension. Ding, the host will lose wealth and power at first, and further penalties can include the removal of host's extended life. A sense of dread enveloped him. Even though losing his extended life would mean death, he realized he might not even live long enough to face that consequence. As a seasoned crime lord, he understood all too well that losing wealth and power often led to a swift demise. With a silent prayer for humanity, Alex resigned himself to the inevitable. The SCPs had to be unleashed to preserve his own existence. Do you at least offer some kind of starter gift? He inquired, his tone reflecting his reluctance to engage with the system. Ding! Congratulations to Host for receiving the SCP. System starting packet. Ding! Host received one SCP of safe class previously unknown to the Foundation. Before him, a small golden ring materialized, floating and slowly rotating in the air. An irresistible urge to wear it washed over him. Gently rotating the golden ring around his finger, Alex admired the warm metal. The ring of the nine cats. Not bad at all. Asmile crept onto his face as he understood the SCP's function. It was straightforward yet extraordinary, nine lives in exchange for nine cats. The concept of the ring might defy logic, 
but who was he to argue with a ring offering resurrection? Ding! System has detected an uncontained SCP. Host is asked to place it in containment as soon as possible for the reward. The announcement caught him off guard, leaving him reluctant to part with such a life-saving artifact. It's a godsend for an ordinary mortal like me, he thought, reluctant to relinquish it. However, an idea suddenly struck him as he eyed the dozen screens in his command center, all displaying the SCP logo except for one, which requested login credentials. With a smirk, he whispered, can't hurt to try, and initiated the login sequence. Please provide credentials. The screen changed, and with a smirk, he confidently provided the requested information. Authorization 051. He figured that since he was to be burdened with the foundation, he might as well claim the top spot, and his experiment paid off. The screen changed in response to his verbal command, and as the computer unlocked for him, so too did information seem to unlock in his mind guiding his actions. He swiftly created an SCP entry, restricting access to O5 clearance. Object Class Tham Special containment procedures must be worn by a member of 05 at all times. As soon as he finished his entry, he heard the ding of his system, and he couldn't help but laugh as he read its message. It fucking worked! Ding! Congratulations to Host for the successful containment of the SCP object and the improvement of the SCP database. As Host contained his first SCP before opening the free Foundation personnel packet, Host has proven himself worthy of overseeing the Foundation, and additional rewards have been unlocked. He could hardly contain his disbelief and joy as the system went on. He didn't expect something like that. Heck, he didn't even know he had a personnel packet waiting to be opened in the first place. Ding! Host has been rewarded with Site EO-11, a Class Three Foundation facility in Washington, D.C., 500 Class C combat personnel, 50 research personnel, 100 administrative personnel, and 30 maintenance personnel. Ding! Host has been rewarded with Site 014, a Class Four Foundation facility in New York, 50 Class B combat personnel, 5,000 Class C combat personnel, 250 research personnel, 1,000 administrative personnel, and 150 maintenance personnel. Host has been rewarded with Unit Alpha-1-250 highly trained combat personnel of Class A as personal protection to members of 05 High Command. Ding! Host has been given an additional reward of the SCP Foundation Disinformation Branch, including Site-644, a Class 5 Foundation facility, 200 Class B Combat Personnel, 5,000 Grade C Combat Personnel, 500 Research Personnel, 1,000 Administrative Personnel, and 300 Maintenance Personnel. One the thousand undercover agents loyal to the Foundation. That last one was a surprise, though a welcome one. He knew SHALD would be out for his blood if they caught wind of him. Not to mention that capturing, securing, and protecting SCPs was not the only job of the Foundation. He also needed to keep the masses ignorant of anything anomalous, and this last reward would go a long way towards making that possible. With all these undercover agents, surely some are embedded within S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA, he mused. Dealing with S.H.I.E.L.D. seemed a daunting task, especially with Nick Fury at the helm. Ding! Host has been given the additional reward of three safe class SCPs in containment at Site-001. And what was Site-001? Well, he is currently sitting in the command center of it. His whole mansion is the site, and his underlings are mostly SCP Foundation members. New knowledge unlocked in his mind, making him aware that he was in charge of getting funding from the underworld, doing dirty deeds, and getting Class D personnel for Foundation use. The revelation that his underlings wouldn't betray him brought significant relief, alleviating one of his primary concerns. This was, however, tempered by the realization that he would now be constantly in the presence of elite agents trained to detect unusual behavior. This posed a problem, considering his persistent and somewhat troublesome habit of talking aloud to himself. Well, there's nothing I can do about that, so let's go look then, he said rather excitedly while pushing his worries and concerns to the background, walking towards the bare wall to the right of his chair. Standing there, he could see no clue that this wall was anything but just that. A wall. He, however, now knew better. Black Hound howls in darkness. 
The wall slid open at his words, revealing a well-lit tunnel lined with vault doors leading to a spacious locker room. Plenty of space for SCPs down here. Almost makes me want to collect them all, he mused, chuckling at his own inner joke as he stepped into the room. The area was mainly equipped with containment lockers for safe class SCP objects. His gaze, however, was drawn to a large safe in one corner. SCP-216, the safe, not the most exciting SCP, but perfectly harmless, so that's good, he said to no one as he stood before the safe. As he was looking it over, information about it entered his mind. It was a safe for which every combination would open a different interior space, making it possible to access whatever was placed inside only with the right combination. A bit underwhelming, there are definitely more intriguing safe-class SCPs out there, he reflected, moving to a locker labeled with a number. SCP. Now this one is dangerous, and fun if used right. Alex stood there for a bit, thinking about how to use this SCP to amuse himself, and went to the final filled locker with his face flushed red. And here we have SCP-05, a key that can open any and all locks. Useful but risky, it could cause havoc in the wrong hands. Satisfied with this last SCP, he nodded to himself and left the room, hearing the wall close behind him with a soft hiss. Back in his control room, he couldn't shake the concern about the random SCP he would soon need to summon. It could be something beneficial, like SCP-500, or it could be catastrophic. He recalled the numerous SCPs he had read about, many of which he preferred not to summon, especially now with the Foundation still in its infancy. Fuck, why did people come up with so many fucking death trap SCPs? Ah, who am I kidding? They did that because it was cool. Seated back in his chair, Alex typed in the number of his old favorite SCP, SCP-2845, the Deer God, a godly being with unimaginable powers and an unfathomable mind. The once cool SCP now filled him with dread. Yeah, this world is fucked. Hopefully, the Ancient One can handle all the Keter-class ones I summon. System. How exactly does summoning SCPs work? Ding. Responding to host SCP objects can be summoned at any time and appear randomly worldwide. However, the chance for them to appear in a setting familiar to the original one, the Foundation encountered them, is increased. So, SCPs originating in the wild are less likely to materialize in urban areas. That's a relief. There are plenty in the database capable of leveling a city quickly. Ding. To summon an SCP, the host needs to use Foundation Points, which can be earned in several ways. Wait, you mean that not only do I need to summon them at least once a month, but I also have to pay for it? Ding. Host is correct. Each summon takes just a thousand Foundation Points. Are there other uses for these points than random summons? Ding. Not currently. So the air might be in the future. Will I still be punished if I fail to summon a new SCP if it is due to not having enough points? Ding. Yes, the system hopes host will work hard to bring glory to the Foundation. Alex sighed heavily, realizing the weight of the responsibility placed upon him. Looks like I have my work cut out for me, he muttered under his breath, steeling himself for the challenges ahead. How many points do I have now? Ding. Host has 200 points for containment of SCP-001, though Host has one free summon as part of the starting packet. Right, didn't I also have a free Foundation personnel packet? Ding. Use all free packets? That might summon the SCP, but I must do that at some point anyway. I could wait, but that might be a bad idea. It's the 15th today, so I have half a month to secure and contain it before considering the next one. Would be even more dangerous if I have more than one out there at a time. Do it. Ding. Congratulations to Host. Host is rewarded with Site 160, a Class 3 Foundation facility in Canada. 500 Grade C Combat Personnel, 50 Research Personnel, 100 Administrative Personnel, and 30 Maintenance Personnel. Ding. Congratulations to Host for being promoted to 051 and becoming the highest ranked person in the SCP Foundation. Ding. Congratulations to Host for getting access to the 051 bank account. Host is now rich. Warning. Host and SCP has appeared in the world and is outside Foundation control. Host is asked to deal with the situation and follow the Foundation's goal of securing, containing, and protecting. Ding. Warning. SCP-77 has appeared. To contain SCP-77, Host is rewarded with a new system function. 
SCP Location Tool can help host find the location of SCP objects. Looking at the barrage of notices, he could not help but feel a little suspicious about the system giving him the same rank as he picked for himself. Was the system reacting to his actions, or did it influence him in ways he was yet aware of? Then, there were concerns about the possibility of other members of Row 5 appearing in the future. He might not have had the foundation for long, but he liked the idea of it being entirely his. Still, though, SCP-787. Rather disappointing, that one. Safe, sure, but boring as well. Not to mention the question of whatever containing it will give me enough points for the next summon. After all, the last safe class object I contained only gave me 200. Though that might just be due to how I went about doing it. Taking the elevator up from his bunker, he appeared in the master bedroom of his manor while taking note that he had been given another foundation facility of C grade. This one had a large enough hangar for the SCP object he needed to contain, though sadly, it was much too far away to be an effective choice. Attention, he yelled out as he left his bedroom, and members of Unit Alpha-1 turned to him, all waiting for his command. An SCP is out there, and the Foundation needs it contained. We are heading to Site-011, and I will personally observe as personnel works to contain the SCP object. He was aware that this was against the rules. Members of Row 5 weren't to risk themselves being near objects. Yet rules are dead, and he is very much alive, so no questions were raised. Neither did they question how he knew about this object. After all, it was taboo to question one's superiors within the Foundation. All agents, in perfect unison, acknowledged with a simple, Yes, sir, as Alex proceeded towards his personal helicopter. It was far from a typical luxury vehicle of the wealthy. This helicopter was a fortress of the sky, armed and bulletproof, a veritable instrument of war. Only thanks to the Foundation could he possess such an asset. He was confident that if the military ever discovered the advanced technology it harbored, they would spare no effort to claim it for themselves. Inform Site Nolem's director of the situation and let them be ready to greet us and to deal with the SCP object. He ordered his escort, Wick, H wasted no time executing it to the letter. The trip was surprisingly quick for the distance traveled, giving him just enough time to calculate the timeline. It's 2008. Iron Man's debut is around the corner with the first Avengers movie in four years. There's some time before things escalate. Time he decided needed to be used well, since the Foundation needed to be ready to act for Loki's invasion at the latest. When he arrived at the base about two hours later, he was greeted by more Foundation personnel, which added to his escort as he made his way to the site of SCP-787. Sir, I'm Dr. Simmons, and I'm in charge of this new SCP situation. We would not have noticed it so soon if it had not been for your warning. So far, we have done our best to prevent any information about it from escaping. But well, you don't just hide that a plane that size appeared on a random field like that. We are doing what we can to contain information, though many other agencies are trying to either take over or join the investigation. The doctor kept briefing Alex about the situation as they drove toward the site in a large formation of pitch-black jeeps, a sight that did not go unnoticed by the locals. Tell me, doctor... Why were we unable to fly to the site itself? Airspace was closed, sir. It was not the first time either. We even struggled to get our men and equipment out. Now we met increased resistance trying to open it up for you. Hmm, it seems I need more agents in the military and government around here. Not to mention S.H.I.E.L.D. is surely intent on taking over this case due to its strangeness. While Alex and the Foundation staff made their way to the site, Another agent from a different organization made a report to his superior. Agent Colson, a large convoy of black jeeps just entered the blocked-off area. You still haven't been able to get access to it? The voice of his superior asked from the other side, as Agent Phil Colson sat at his desk, working on different projects and cases he had been entrusted with. He had initially not paid much attention to the agent and this mysterious plane situation, but was slowly becoming more interested. No, sir, the Air Force is doing everything they can to keep us out so far. We barely kept the airspace closed around here, though we are unsure if we can keep that up for long either. All right, 
Just keep up the pressure and take note of everything happening there for now. Yes, sir. With that, Coulson hung up and grew even more curious about what it was the Air Force was trying so hard to hide from S.H.I.E.L.D. Sir, we have arrived, Dr. Simmons announced as the convoy halted. Tim only here to observe, perhaps provide some input. For now, focus on the most important steps of the investigation, then move the object out of here before going in depth. Alex instructed. Observing the surroundings, Alex noted curious civilians lingering around the established perimeter and what appeared to be a local reporter. Among the crowd, a few individuals, dressed a bit too sharply to be ordinary onlookers, caught his eye. Likely agents from S.H.I.E.L.D., he surmised. His own personnel, donned in military uniform, effectively barred them from getting too close, citing their strict orders. Internally, Alex pondered the complexity of his situation. Maintaining secrecy from S.H.I.E.L.D. is proving more challenging than anticipated. The Foundation's methods can be quite intrusive, and S.H.I.E.L.D. isn't accustomed to being left out, especially not if we are going to have incidents occurring monthly. As he contemplated strategies to manage S.H.I.E.L.D.'s involvement, Foundation agents diligently inspected the SCP. Alex knew that due to the loss of many Foundation sites that the database for SCP objects was currently empty. This meant that he held exclusive knowledge about this SCP. He could have shared this information, but he was still trying to figure out how to deal with this entire situation, as well as taking advantage of this chance to see the Foundation at work. Doing it this way would allow him to see if they would reach the same conclusions this time around as well. Get me the initial classification and a report of their work so far, Alex ordered. Reading through it, he was surprised that they had given it the Euclid class mark. As he continued to read, he started to figure out why that was. They currently didn't know if it would disappear from its current location in a manner similar to how it had suddenly appeared. Alex knew that it was a safe class object, though reading on, he saw that they didn't even mention that possibility once. Clearly, that kind of classification was only given out after careful research. It was interesting to see how they worked and what thoughts they worked through as they studied an anomaly. He gained a new kind of respect for the Foundation personnel as he saw them in action for the first time. They've earned an unexpected 41 points without much effort. Is it the result of the team's work or the public stir we're causing? It is ironic to gain points from both fulfilling the Foundation's objectives and attracting attention, given that one of the Foundation's key objectives is to avoid attracting attention. Time flew, and the Foundation persevered despite resistance from parts of the military, FAA, NTSB, TSA, and SHIELD. It had been necessary to acquire an old military airfield nearby, due to having nowhere else to store SCP-787. It was an expensive acquisition, though thankfully, he had been able to bribe his way past any questions. Phil Coulson stood apprehensively outside the director's office, preparing to deliver his report. As one of the agency's top agents, he was unaccustomed to the sense of failure that now weighed on him. In this case, the Air Force's unwavering determination was something he still struggled to comprehend. He knocked and entered promptly, finding his boss facing away from him, a preferred stance that masked his facial expressions. While also showcasing the trust he had for him, he wouldn't show his back to him otherwise. So, what do you have for me, Colson? His boss inquired. Yes, sir. One regret to inform you that we've hit a wall. The Air Force completely stonewalled us, sir, Colson reported, bracing for a response. Continue, came the tense command. Yes, sir, we have scant details about the aircraft. It bore no identifying marks or numbers. We identified the plane's model, but that trail went cold as we found no missing aircraft of that type reported, and all crafts seem accounted for. Under pressure, the investigators did reveal that the plane carried passengers, or rather, bodies. There were 515 deceased individuals, presumably passengers and crew. Can we confirm that? We managed to obtain a photograph of the interior. It was in disrepair, littered with bodies. Disrepair? Elaborate. The plane's exterior appeared brand new, but the interior showed signs of extensive wear, misuse, and neglect. Have the bodies been identified? Not yet, sir. The photo we have doesn't reveal any faces. Given that we couldn't get close, it was taken from far away and from a subpar angle. 
Hmm, all right. We'll await the Air Force's report to understand their motives for such tight-lipped secrecy. Dismissed. Coulson left, leaving Fury alone with his thoughts. Determination stirred in him. He was resolved to uncover what the Air Force was concealing from SLA for Lee LD. Ding, ding. Congratulations to the host for containing SCP-787. Rewards are being given out. Ding. Host has been rewarded with three stealth Quinjets in all current bases and 50 engineer class personnel at all sites. While not extraordinary, the reward was nonetheless valuable, reminding Alex of the potential benefits the Marvel Universe's technology could offer the Foundation. 051 to all site directors, you have been allocated three stealth Quinjets. If additional units are needed, Reverse engineering is authorized to understand their mechanics. Coordinate amongst yourselves to achieve this shared objective. Alex abruptly ended the comm. Communication, putting his phone away. Not waiting for a response, and resumed his leisurely position by the pool. He reclined in a chair, leisurely sipping a glass of red wine. Now, this is quite the way to enjoy oneself. Imagine if the pool were graced with naked beauties, he mused, allowing himself a moment of indulgent fantasy. However, his thoughts soon drifted back to SCP-113, prompting him to shake his head vigorously to clear the provocative images. That SCP is more treacherous than its file indicates. Could it possess a mimetic effect? He wondered, striving to settle into a more relaxed state. Even though Alexander Ritchie was accustomed to a life of luxury, he himself was not. Therefore, he rationalized that a bit of celebration for today's achievements was perfectly acceptable. Chapter 3 Shadows and Schemes, too. Alexander Ritchie stood in the heart of his elegantly appointed bedroom, bathed in soft ambient light highlighting its stylish decor. He approached the sleek minimalist closet door and pressed a hidden button. A smooth mechanical voice broke the silence, asking, What is today's theme? Business as usual, Alex replied with a hint of resolve in his voice. Instantly, the doors slid open with a barely a hiss, unveiling a meticulously organized collection of form-fitting black tailored suits and an array of complementary ties. He selected his attire with practiced ease, the fabric hugging his frame perfectly. As a final touch, he affixed a small black and gold pin, the emblem of the foundation, to his chest, a subtle nod to the allegiance that underpinned his every move. Descending to the dining room, Alex savored a breakfast crafted by his skilled chefs, each bite a blend of nutrition and culinary artistry. Yet, as he accessed the system to check his points, a shadow crossed his otherwise composed demeanor. The system's chime was both a reminder and a rebuke. Ding, host has 846 foundation points. Keep working hard for the glory of the foundation. Despite utilizing every resource at his disposal, including gift packets and bonus rewards for an obscure achievement, not to mention containing the SCP object, Alex found himself short of the points needed for the upcoming mandatory summon. I must find a solution before the month ends, to not only prepare for the next SCP, but also to ensure I have a buffer of points for the future, he mused with a strategic mindset, aiming for a new operational benchmark, to start each month fully prepared. His return to his room was met with routine, yet the act of pressing the closet button and hearing the familiar inquiry, what is today's theme, felt like a momentary escape from his pressing concerns. Casual as always, he responded, though the reveal of a steel wall instead of clothing reminded him there was no true respite in his world. Authorization 5-1, he commanded. A panel slid open, and upon scanning his hand, the steel wall silently parted to reveal an elevator. His prompt, down, please, initiated descent into the heart of his operations, a command bunker that was both sanctuary and center of his endless toil. Seated at his command, Alex navigated through a flurry of emails and demands, his decisions swift and often uncompromising. A thought lingered in his mind, a strategic consideration for the Foundation's future. With an increasing roster of personnel and a limited number of SCPs, the balance of engagement and loyalty is delicate. Our relevance and contribution to humanity are what bind their loyalty. This equilibrium must be maintained. The challenges were ceaseless. Insufficient points for summoning, the necessity of summoning for multiple reasons, and the looming presence of S.H.I.E.L.D. Sighing to himself, Alex returned to work and allowed the hours to pass quickly. 
Time flew as he worked tirelessly to maintain the sprawling SCP Foundation single-handedly. He couldn't help but draw a sardonic parallel to his roles within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Not the glamour of a magic-wielding hero, but the gritty reality of a bureaucrat buried under paperwork and financial burdens. The very idea of being transported into a world such as the MCU, and then, rather than partake in all the excitement, he instead had to do boring and mundane work day and night. And after all this work, I wouldn't even be worth more than a B-show TV series as a villain, he thought mockingly to himself. Though I really didn't need that extra 5-1 bank account to be rich, Alex said to himself as he was trying to come to terms with just how much money he really had. Sure, on the surface, Alexander Ritchie had a worth of around 800 million USD, but in the underworld, his wealth ballooned to 600 billion. With a B, though there is a lot of money going into just running the Ritchie family, not to mention what is needed for the foundation. Running the Ritchie family and the foundation is financially draining, he noted. The setting he found himself in, heading one of the foundation's financial arms, was fortuitous, as the system assigned sites and bases demanded significant funds. Remember reading somewhere that it was rumored that the chaos insurgency was a part of the foundation that took care of the dirty work. Is that what I am? Head of the insurgency and 5-1. All the stuff I do as head of the Ritchie family is dark stuff, and my people are foundation people. He pondered, considering the implications of his dual roles. Sure is a lot to take in in so little time. Alex thought to himself, still feeling slightly off about the whole thing. After all, he had never had to run any business before yesterday, and now he was running the damn foundation. Though at least I won't lack D-class personnel, that's for sure. He couldn't help but think as he read notes and files from the many thousands of agents under him who oversaw gangs around the world. All of them offered the criminals under them up for D-class work. Still, I need more money and more undercover agents everywhere to ensure I can work in secret. Can't have S.H.I.E.L.D. get in the way of Foundation work. They might be trying to do what we are, but they can't do it. Not as long as they are under the thumb of the government. Fury is many things, but willing and able to break out is not among them. Being stuck in a bunker all day wasn't the most exciting of things. So as soon as he was done with the more sensitive part of his Foundation work, he decided to relocate to his upstairs office. Not only was the office luxurious and comfortable, but it also allowed him the company and use of his aides. Get me a call to Dr. Simmons of Site 1. He called out to the empty office after spotting an internal communication bearing the label of SCP-787, and sure enough, a member of Alpha 1 stepped inside the office a moment later with a phone, which he handed to Alex. Dr. Simmons? Yes, sir. I'm here the doctor responded. Very well, I would like a report about the SCP situation and if any more challenges have presented themselves while trying to contain it. Alex asked lightly while going through a bit of paperwork. Yes, sir. So far we have found no anomalous properties to the SCP object other than the fact that it could not have appeared like that on its own with normal means. We also believe that we are dealing with SCP Object 787. Sir, I know that you are likely aware and already working on a fix, but about the loss of the database and the containment breach. Alex quickly interrupted the good doctor there. You are right to assume that I am aware. The Zero Five Council is also meeting right now about the situation. For now, just focus on the task ahead. He really didn't want to be reminded about that messy situation again. Even with only a few sites, he was still drowning in requests and concerns about that damn issue. Yes, sir. We are currently working with the assumption that it is SCP-787. We don't have the file itself due to the current situation, so other than the name and the fact it was apparently a safe class object, well, the staff here don't have anyone else who remembers much about the object. So for now, we are still going through the process step by step. So once we recover a copy of the file, we can match our findings with that to confirm our theory. Teat was doing this work, we found another instance of SCP-787-1. It was recovered from the waste storage tank of all places. We are working on identifying all instances of 7871 so far, and progress is being made. 
What we have discovered so far gives little clue as to the nature of Object 787 itself. As for the other point, there is more to report on that front. We have had multiple attempts of infiltration to the new Site 787, as we have called it until a proper number is assigned. The agents that helped secure the SCP object are all being pressured into giving up data or even releasing SCP-787 itself to external parties. Dr. Simo, NS dutifully reported all he knew, though it was little information the system hadn't given him already. However, Alex still wondered how that person entered the waste storage tank. Give them something to chew on, can't let them turn desperate on us for now. If needed, get help from Site-644 in writing up something and let it leak out to those trying hard enough. Otherwise, you may continue doing as you are or move the SCP object to Site-160 if possible. You have my permission for that, at least. Alex finished off before letting the doctor get back to his work. A need to somehow deal with S.H.I.E.L.D., which is not going to happen anytime soon. They have too much manpower and are getting the support of the UN and USA. He thought to himself as he finished up the last of his work. Alex once again found himself lounging in front of the pool with a glass of wine in his hand as he slowly started to form plans in his head. It was a relaxing place, and he did need a little time to relax after sitting by a desk since morning. A need to build up the Ritchie family to get more money for the foundation. It's making more than enough for the current needs of the foundation, though given that I will be getting more sites constantly, who knows how long that will last. No, the real problem will be both having enough liquid funds for the foundation and a few personal projects I have in mind. He thought, scrolling through the news on his phone. The only thing that caught his eye was an article about a mysterious plane that had appeared in a random field. He could clearly see the work of Site 644 in the article. It was so crazy that had it been about a UFO instead, it would probably have been more believable. Next, we just need a big event that will shift attention away from it, he slowly deduced, and suddenly, he had an idea. Tomorrow morning, I want a story in the news about Tony Stark becoming a father. Alex said out aloud, and even though he didn't get a reply, he knew that it would only take minutes before that story was written up. Ah, how he enjoyed being in charge. Now, if only he could get a picture of Tony's reaction to learning that his secret child made the news worldwide. Tony Stark's home. Tony was busy being a brilliant engineer and inventor for once, rather than a useless playboy when he suddenly sneezed. Oh, is someone talking about me? Tony thought as he scratched his nose before getting back to his work with a smile on his face as he surely imagined some model or movie star with his name on their tongue. 001 Back at his dinner table, Alex attentively listened to reports on the Ritchie family's activities. The Ten Rings resurgence is complicating our operations globally, particularly in the East, but its influence is palpable even here in the States and across Europe, one of his subordinates reported. Collaborations are becoming increasingly strained. The Ten Rings, you say? Alex asked as he paused and thought for a moment. Yes, sir. The Ten Rings. Hmm. All right. I might have to speak with the Mandarin himself if this continues. If Kingpin takes this as a chance to act up, let me know, and I will have a talk with him. The same goes for the Hand. He said mildly, though it caused the people in the room to show bloodthirsty smiles. Understood, boss the agent said before finishing his report, but nothing else caught Alex's attention after that point, as he was busy trying to remember what he could about the Mandarin from the movie about his son. After his meal, Alex made his way down to his bunker, opened up his personal SCP database, and began writing up a new entry. SCP-1000, The Mandarin, Object Special Containment Procedures, due to his own personal power and the power of the organization, the Ten Rings. The Mandarin is not yet in containment, but was until recently thought of as a safe class object. Containment should, as of right now, focus on aiding his goals without releasing SCP-3666. This is to once again have his assigned class be reduced to safe. It is advised against attempting to place object in containment while it is actively using SCP-Object-1010110. 
Should a chance for separating SCP Object 1000 from Object 1110 appear, it is recommended to take it. Description SCP-1000 is a man of Asian descent. The object has been active for more than 1,000 years in the area around China and can be considered as the de facto ruler of the area. He is highly skilled in combat and is surrounded by armies of loyal followers, which are also spread throughout the world. He is known to be in possession of SCP-1010, also known as the Ten Rings, which grant him his unending lifespan and multiple unique powers, though due to inconsistent data, the specifics are unknown. Alex finished writing the first entry and had already assigned another two SCP numbers, so he also decided to fill out those two, though he hated how high the numbers were. Still, with close to 1,000 SCPs from the SCP universe that could be summoned randomly, he didn't want to run into conflicting numbers down the line. The only reason he had named his ring as SCP-001 was that there were already a lot of entries for that, so he didn't mind adding his own. SCP-13666, The Dweller in Darkness Special Containment Procedures SCP-3666 is currently contained using Redacted. Continued use of Redacted ensures there is no risk of escape. In the event of any signs of escape, a code black must be initiated due to the potential for an XK-class end-of-the-world event. Description. By orders of 5-1, details about this SCP are classified. Alex found himself quite liking making these entries even if only he would have access to them. He decided that he would find time to help the rest of the Foundation get at least some of this information, though he might need to redact information further. SCP-1010, the Tech Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures, not under Foundation control currently. The Ten Rings should be securely stored in a safe class containment box, with no experiments conducted, without permission from at least two-thirds of 05 Command. Description. A series of Ten Rings of unknown make and material. They are at least 1,000 years old. Being in possession of the object is known to grant the holder anomalous powers, including but not limited to eternal life. The Rings are currently in a powered-down state and should be kept like that, lest a reclassification be needed. SCP-12501, Talo, Object Class, Thamiel, Special Containment Procedures, is not contained by the Foundation currently but should be protected by Foundation personnel to prevent possible XK-Class event. Description, Redacted by Order of 5 one Finishing yet another entry into the database, he leaned back, feeling rather satisfied with himself. He understood why so many people had made SCPs back then, though he wished they had made fewer dangerous ones. Still, he was a little worried about the newly coined SCP-13666, since he knew that the Dweller in Darkness was a super all-ending bad boss in some comics, and only in the movie was it something that could be beaten so easily. So, he was rather worried that it would take after the comics more than the movie one. Guess I should try not to let him be released in the first place. Should have a few decades for that, right? Alex whispered while leaning back and thinking about how he should go about that. Dealing with the Mandarin won't be easy. One doesn't rule as a warlord for that long and not have a few tricks up his sleeves. Not to mention that, that I don't know what his rings can do since they could do some crazy shit in the comics but were rather boring in the movie. A sigh escaped his lips as he thought about how to deal with the Mandarin threat, though as he had written in the entry, the best would be to help him just get his dead wife back. Now he might not have an SCP that could give him that, but he could still find a way for sure. SCP-1252, Resurrection Serum, Object Class, Safe Special Containment Procedures, N. O samples of this are in Foundation containment as of now. Though the organization, the Hand, is known to have at least one dose of it and the ability to produce more, so a normal security box for safe objects should be able to hold it. Description. Created by the hand, this serum can reanimate the dead and alter memories. It reportedly contains dragon bone material. The Foundation has not analyzed a sample directly, so comprehensive data is unavailable. SCP-254. Object Class. Special Containment Procedures. Not in Foundation Custody. 
maintain at temperatures below minus 25 degrees Celsius. Description, a Cree corpse from the 1995 incident, currently in Shield's possession. It has potential resurrection capabilities, but may induce side effects treatable with potent amnestics. With another two entries written down and added to his growing database, Alex leaned back and yawned while a plan took form in the back of his head. However, to go further, he needs to get the file of Project Tahiti from S.H.I.E.L.D., which might prove hard to do. It seems I need to look into what agents are inside S.H.I.E.L.D., and if there is none that fits the bill, look into finding someone who can steal it. There should be some master thief around the MCU who can do that. Alex said as he tried to remember any super thief from the MCU. Though let's hope the Foundation can handle it on its own, might authorize for the use of SCP-005 if needed. Alex thought as he sat back and felt a sudden desire to have a white cat in his lap while he sat in his secret underground bunker, planning to steal top-secret files from the world's most powerful spy organization. Chapter 4. Manipulating the Foundation. 3. Alex awoke to another day, the sun's rays piercing his tired eyes. He could easily have blocked the light but chose not to, finding value in rising with dawn's first light. It's been a week already, hasn't it? He muttered, sitting up. It had indeed been a hectic week, filled with ups and downs, from getting sent to a dangerous world with a system hell-bent on making it even more dangerous, to the whole lifestyle change from his previous life, which he admittedly didn't remember much about, though he knew he wasn't living the life of a multi-billionaire there. That had only been the start of the week as well. There truly was no rest for members of the Foundation. And he, as a member of the O5 Command, was no different. It turned out that if you take people who are fully invested in containing SCP objects, then spawn them into a universe without those same SCP objects, which they were certain they should have contained at their site, they wanted an answer answers only he could give them. In the comfy chair in his private command bunker, Alex sat and opened a notice in the Foundation's systems. He had hoped that his own system would somehow have solved this for him. But while it seemed that the Foundation members didn't question their shift into the MCU, they still did question the sudden loss of SCPs in containment and the wipe of the whole SCP database. He had been pushing making a decision on this matter back for the past few days, unsure of how to properly deal with it. Yet, he could no longer ignore the cries for answers. You can't trust systems to do their job these days. Alex cursed under his breath. System, how many points do I have? Ding, host has 954 points. Keep working hard for the glory of the Foundation. He was finally getting close to the amount he needed to summon his next SCP. Given the amount he earned, he determined that each SCP entry he made gave him 10 points. It was not a lot, but at least it was something he could do if he needed just the last few points, though there were only that many things from the MCU he could make an entry on. All right, let's get this over with and hope they buy it. He prayed in his heart as he started typing away. Priority notice, A543, B12, A11, to all site directors with clearance of class 4. From the mouth of the unanimous O5 Council, we hereby inform you that a CK class restructuring scenario has occurred. Due to this, the Foundation has lost possession of all SCP objects that were in containment prior to the event. All sites are to stand on high alert and be ready to contain any SCP that re-emerges. Successful use of SCP-3022 has been confirmed, and all SCP files have been restored to the Foundation. Due to uncertainty surrounding the CK class event, these files are to be taken only as a rough guideline until the information can be verified through proper testing. Contact with all Foundation sites has yet to be established, and all sites are to be ready to assist where needed. Secure. Contain. Protect. Signed, 051. Alex reviewed the notice he had prepared. Fully aware this course of action would increase his workload significantly, but he also believed it was crucial for maintaining the Foundation's loyalty and dedication to its mission. At least he would be able to push the matter of explaining things onto the site directors, leaving him free to worry about other things. He carefully crafted the notice to appear as if it originated from the entire O5 Council, not revealing that he, Alexander Ritchie, was the sole person in control. 
In truth, only members of Alpha-1 and the directors of Class-5 sites were privy to his status as 5 to 1. The rest of the Foundation staff believed that Alexander Ritchie was merely the assistant to a 5-1 and a spokesperson for the Council. Secrecy and paranoia much. Alex whispered as he changed the authority needed to access the SCP-3022 file. Since he didn't want anyone to run out and read up on its use and possibly question the authenticity of his claim. A. Lex sent out the notice and shared the system-given database with the rest of the Foundation. He leaned back and closed his eyes, not wanting to see as one after one the few sites he had all began reporting to be on high alert. Though as warnings came from all the speakers around him, he couldn't ignore them and had to turn the alarm off in the end, though the red lights blinking from the monitors didn't stop. Ding! System is pleased with how hosts dealt with the current crisis to the Foundation and a one-time reward has been released. System is making host aware that it won't give more rewards for similar actions. The system's announcement took Alex by surprise, and he couldn't help but curse as the system was aware of the damn problem this whole time. Yet rather than fix things itself, he needed to wreak his poor brain to come up with a possible solution. Damn useless system of mine, at least give me a good reward for this. Alex said as he had the system send him the reward. Ding! Host has been rewarded with SCP-3022 for his dedication to holding the Foundation together. Keep working hard for the glory of humanity. Ding! The system has detected an uncontained SCP. Host is asked to place it in containment as soon as possible for the reward. Observing the two notifications, Alex glanced down to find SCP-3022 materialized in his lap. This SCP is certainly worth safeguarding closely. He resolved swiftly rising to secure the SCP in a spare vault within his containment wing. He also couldn't help but notice that, just like the ring, this object didn't appear as a contained object like the three other safe class rewards. Clearly, there was some kind of underlying difference here he had yet to grasp. System, how many points do I have now? Alex whispered under his breath while he dressed in another of his black tailor-made suits. Ding. Host has an 1814 Foundation points. Keep working hard for the glory of the Foundation. Alex couldn't help but smile as he heard that number. There was less than a week until the first, and he had more than enough points, meaning that he didn't have to worry. Putting SCP-3022 into containment had netted him some points, but the real reward had been mixing in some new MCU SCPs into the database as he merged his with the Foundation. He had been able to confirm that doing so gave 90 points for each new Marvel object. There was also the new Class 3 base up in Sweden that he got as a reward. It was not much, but at this point, he needed bases everywhere. The only downside to having done this is that while all the bases are on high alert, they are burning even more money. Other than lying to the Foundation, he had also been working hard to try and get more funds for it. This past week, he had spent more than 175 million USD to contain a single safe class SCP and support the shift to high alert. Then there were the few billions spent investing in a few companies he knew would end up earning him more in the future. So much work, so little time. Alex muttered as he sat down at his table to eat breakfast. Looking at the stack of newspapers lying beside him, he could see that Tony and his secret child were still front page news. He was still sad that he hadn't been able to get any pictures or recordings of his reaction. The story had been wildly popular, yet he couldn't help but imagine how much more so it would have been if he had announced himself as Iron Man. The story seemed unlikely to leave the front page for at least another week, and that was only as long as someone didn't fan the flames again. With Tony Tony Stark, the most brilliant man in the world, not to mention the richest and most handsome, had not had a good few days. It all started one morning when pretty much every single newspaper ran a story about him fathering a secret child. Now, it wasn't like Tony didn't engage in plenty of activities that could result in such a thing, but he was always careful. Damn it. Pepper hadn't even wanted to speak to him if it wasn't about work, further, he passed few days. Damn it, if it wasn't because suing every news agency in the world would be too much work, I would do it. Whoever you are, I will get you for starting this damn rumor. 
Tony swore as he saw that every media in the world was still running wild with this story. In fact, among his close circle, only Obadiah Stane seemed to be happy with the news since it had bumped up the stock of the company, and he seemed sure it wouldn't fall when the story finally fell out of the spotlight. Tony was half sure Obadiah might even be feeding the rumor himself by now. Back with Alex. With only a few days remaining before the next SCP summoning, Alex resolved not to initiate any new projects until this critical task was managed. However, this decision didn't mean a respite from his duties, as he was consistently engaged with both Ritchie family and Foundation affairs. Now back in his control bunker, Alex diligently oversaw the Foundation's agents and sites. The state of high alert for SCPs had led to the identification of several potential leads within the MCU. While no SCP objects had been secured yet, his agents were actively following up on the clues. It's reassuring to see them excel in their roles independently. As long as I get more undercover agents in S.H.I.E.L.D., I should be able to get SCPs from under their noses. After all, they are the people who would typically deal with such things. Alex thought with a smirk on his face at the image on Fury's face as he split his head over who was messing with him. Speak of the devil, and he shall appear. It would seem Fury have set his eyes on a little spider. Alex mused as he read an email from one of his few agents undercover in S.H.I.E.L.D. that said that Fury was targeting Black Widow. Won't be long before she joins up now. Alex contemplated his strategy regarding Natasha Romanoff. Should he intervene and recruit her before she joined S.H.I.E.L.D., taking the safer but less advantageous route? Or should he wait for her S.H.I.E.L.D. enlistment, opting for a riskier but more rewarding approach? He sent a message back to his agent, instructing them to monitor the situation closely and report any developments. In the meantime, he continued his work as usual. His focus was on an agent who might assist with a specific task he had in mind. Tomorrow is the big day, eh? Finally, I will be bringing yet another SCP here, six safe ones so far. I got to admit, I kind of want a Euclid one this time. Alex thought to himself as he lay at his favorite spot near the pool with a glass of wine. He just watched the empty courtyard and allowed his mind to wander. Sir, the game is starting soon. A guard came up and said from a respectful distance, T will be watching it from here. Alex replied lazily. As his subordinates got to work, bringing out a flat screen for him. Soon, the soothing tranquil was broken by the sound of the football game. The real deal, not that stupid American kind. Look at that, Alex said, pointing to the screen where one could see thousands of people filled with joy and hugging one another wildly as their team scored a goal. This is why we do it, to protect the civilians and keep them ignorant of the dangers out there so they can enjoy their life. He told the guards hidden around him. He enjoyed watching the game, yet he couldn't help but feel that watching it only after the game had concluded wasn't quite the same. He would have much preferred to watch it live. Yet, as Amber of the O5 Council, he wasn't allowed to do such a thing. Anything he watched had to be screened first by Foundation staff to ensure that he wouldn't accidentally see a picture of the shy guy. Even his news app was something made and controlled by the Foundation, showing him only what was safe. This did carry the risk that the Foundation could keep him unaware of things they didn't want him to know. Not that there was a high chance of that, given the large number of people having to be in on such a scheme. The following morning, after a filling breakfast, Alexander Ritchie, Row 51 and newest, outsider to the world of Marvel, found himself down in his personal bunker and finishing up the most important foundation work he wanted out of the way before today's main event. Just about done here and then, we can do it. Two hours later, with a hint of apprehension, Alex broke the silence. System, summon one random SCP for the monthly minimum, please. Ding, understood host, please stand by as the random SCP is summoned. Ding, warning. Host a SCP has appeared in the world and is outside Foundation control. Host is asked to deal with the situation and follow the Foundation's goal of securing, containing, and protecting. Please let it be a simple enough Euclid one. Alex prayed while holding his breath. Ding. Warning. SCP Redacted has appeared. Upon hearing the alert, Alex could muster only three words. Fuck. Akeeter. Chapter 5. Big Fish, Big Trouble. 
Forning, warning, Hosta SCP has appeared in the world and is outside Foundation control. Host is asked to deal with the situation and follow the Foundation's goal of securing, containing, and protecting little enough Euclid one. Alex prayed while holding his breath. Warning, SCP-69 has appeared. Upon hearing the alert, Alex could muster only three words. Fuck, a keter. His response underscored the gravity of the situation as he braced for the complexities associated with containing a Keter-class SCP. Ding. Congratulations to Host for getting Site-169, a Class IV Foundation facility in the Philippines. 50 Class B combat personnel, 5,000 Class C combat personnel, 250 research personnel, 1,000 administrative personnel, and 150 maintenance personnel. Ding. Congratulations to Host for getting Site 300, a Class III Foundation facility in Chile. 500 Class C combat personnel, 50 research personnel, 100 administrative personnel, and 30 maintenance personnel. Ding! Congratulations to Host for getting Site 053, a Class III Foundation facility in Brunei. 500 Class C combat personnel, 50 research personnel, 100 administrative personnel, and 30 maintenance personnel. Ding! Host has been awarded with 500 naval vessels belonging to the Foundation. Looking at the stuff he got just for summoning this SCP, Alex was nearly drooling at the thought of the rewards he would earn if he got this SCP placed in containment. However, that dream only lasted until the moment he read the information about the SCP object from the database, and he nearly burst into tears as he dismissed the system. Mere moments later, alarms started to sound from his computer as the new sites would get his notice about the CK-class event and would quickly follow the order within. System, why must you torment me like this? Yet the system had no answer for this and just left him to deal with the bad news that was the fact that this world just got another possible way to suddenly meet a quick end. Because, of course, the first SCP I summoned would be a useless safe class, only for the next one to be a Keter class so dangerous that it can cause multiple types of K-class events while fucking sleeping. Alex cursed in his heart and blamed this broken system of his for doing him in like this. Sure, just ask me to contain an uncontainable SCP, why don't you? Yeah, why don't I just place an SCP the size of a fucking continent in containment? Alex spent the next half hour venting his frustration in his bunker before a new alert brought his attention back to his computer. What now? He grumbled, but gave it his full attention nonetheless. So they already confirmed the presence of SCP-169. Well, they are more useful than my damn system, that's for sure. Why my oh-so-useful SCP locating tool is ever so helpful in informing me that SCP-169 is on Earth? Like, I would care about it at all if it was anywhere else. So yeah, thanks for being so specific. With a sigh, Alex simply informed the sites to keep an eye on the SCP object and not allow anyone else to come and disturb their sleeping giant. He could easily imagine Hydra trying to do something that would end up waking up the Leviathan while striving to further their little goals. Guess I might just get back to work, not going to get any action out of 169. This month will be about expanding the Ritchie family. That, and dealing with the ever-increasing Foundation work. Alexander and the Foundation were not the only ones picking up on the appearance of a creature as large as SCP-169. No, atop a snowy mountain sat a woman whose eyes snapped open the moment Alex's system informed him of the SCP being in the world. The bald woman quickly closed her eyes and sunk back into meditation as she sought out the source of the disturbance she had just felt. A life source this strong? She exclaimed in shock and disbelief as she felt a massive source of life energy, one far stronger than anything she had ever felt before. She quickly toot up and formed a golden portal. The Ancient One, the Sorcerer Supreme, stood in the air over the ocean and looked down. Her eyes easily pierced through the waters to behold the colossal creature below. Shocked, she struggled to comprehend its immense size. This is impossible, the way it is laying, almost as if it has been there for countless years. She whispered, as she couldn't believe that this creature had been here long before she was born, and she had never noticed it. Why have I never seen anything like this in all the many futures I have seen? She questioned herself before shaking her head 
and leaving through a golden portal. Never knowing that someone had seen her and that a report would get sent about her to a mysterious man in New York. Alex was just finishing up the SCP entry for a certain bald sorcerer who had spooked his agents earlier that day. Ultimately, he had no choice but to promise to make available the top secret file on the SCP that had been spotted above 169. To do that, he just needed to write such a file first. Object Class Special Containment Procedures SCP-77 remains outside Foundation control due to the challenges of containment, the risks involved, and the fact that SCP-1077 is actively working on containing an unknown number of SCP objects, many of which are Euclid or Keter class. Description The object appears to be a woman of Asian descent, is bald, and wears monk robes. She is the current leader of the group of interest, masters of the mystic arts. She is the current owner of Redacted. The full range of her abilities is unknown, but she is rated as being highly dangerous and should not be underestimated. If needed, the way to contact her is Redacted. He hoped the Ancient One wouldn't mind how he described her in this entry, but he knew very little about her and would rather not write down something he was unsure about. He did keep a few things hidden about her since she was so dangerous, and he didn't want to have to deal with her while he was still just an ordinary mortal. Having done that, and pretty much fully dealt with the new SCP he had summoned, he found himself with a lot of free time this month. Free time he would spend dealing with a few Marvel plot lines if he could. One of those just required him to get his hands on a top-secret shield file, something he thought he had a chance of doing. All right, agent, do me proud and get me this file without alerting Fury. Alex said under his breath as he greenlit the mission and gave the okay for the requested resources. It had been a week since Alex decided to give the green light for the mission to get the file of Project Tahiti, and finally, he got his hands on it. He had to admit it did make for an interesting read for sure. He was very impressed with how S.H.I.E.L.D. had studied SCP-1254. Still, he would like to think his foundation would have done a better job. Not that it stopped him from noting down the names of those in charge of the project as possible recruits for the foundation. Getting his hands on this damn file had not been easy either, and he still struggled with the fact that out of a full 1,000 undercover agents, he only had three in S.H.I.E.L.D. Hydra. He slowly realized just how small a part of the full might of the foundation he truly had. Sure. He had agents everywhere, but what use was that random agent in animal control in Texas? Yeah, rather useless, for now at least. I need more manpower, and for that I need more money, or gods forbid, more SCPs. Fuck here I thought the about 160,000 personnel would be a lot, but it's a drop in a bucket compared to what I need. Still, that one drop still needs more money than one would believe. Alex sighed as he was slowly coming to terms with just how truly massive the Foundation was and how monstrous a task it was leading it. The biggest problem is going to be money. If I get a base or two every month, I should be able to at least not be totally starved for personnel. But the money to support that personnel will come up short quickly. His biggest problem was that while he did have money to spare, he had to use it in ways that couldn't be tracked which meant that everything he needed to purchase was far more expensive than it should have been. He had even been tempted to check the bank account of 051, and oh boy, had that been a surprise. Yet due to his system messing with him, he found himself reluctant to use those funds. The agents in the U.S. Air Force still had to be given extra funds to bribe others to keep things about SCP-787 under control. The cost of keeping that one SCP contained was getting awfully expensive due to the presence of S.H.I.E.L.D. Not to mention the first waves of bribes he had paid out while actively working on containing it. Thankfully, he had his future knowledge to work off to invest in some legitimate businesses that he knew would do well, on the side of his illegal revenue streams. For now, I have to wait for the Iron Man plot to take off so I can make some easy money on the crash of Stark stocks, then even more by also playing on the second crash and rise. Shaking his head, Alex stood up, took both the file and the small box beside it, and entered the secret containment vault of Site-001. 
There, he placed the file inside SCP-216 and placed the box inside the locker labeled SCP-005 before returning to above ground. All right, let's get started with this meeting. With the current state of heightened alert and the need to recontain everything once again, we are going to need more funds. Which means we need to increase the scale of the Ritchie family so more money can be extracted towards more important projects. Alex said as he entered a meeting room filled with some of his trusted subordinates who oversaw the more bored day-to-day -day dealings of the Ritchie Mafia, while also being Foundation personnel. Yes, Master Ritchie, I have been following your order to get a meeting with the Mandarin, though I have not yet been successful in that desire. It is hard enough for people within the Ten Rings to meet him, much less outsiders like us. Naturally, the Ritchie family is not someone that can be ignored, not even by him, so I expect we will have our meeting within the month. The first to report was an elderly man with gray hair and a large scar on his face. Elderly he might be, but his tight suit made no effort to hide his impressive and robust body. The next one to speak up was a younger man with a fine goatee. I have been more successful in my endeavor, sir. I have already booked a meeting with Obadiah Stain for this Thursday. As for Fisk, he will be ready to meet you whenever you so desire. Ulysses Clow was rather more difficult, but he agreed when I informed him that you would be traveling down to meet him in person. That meeting is scheduled for next Friday. Alex nodded in satisfaction as he heard the report, while he would have liked to talk with SCP-1000 before Stain. He knew well enough that it had been an unlikely wish. And what of recruitment? We are making progress on that front as well, boss, though it won't be going as fast as we would have liked. The world is currently a chaotic place with the Ten Rings and other similar organizations all working hard on recruitment of their own. Still, I expect that we will be able to increase the pace soon enough. Another man stepped up to report on his question. Well, hopefully, Stain and Ulysses will compensate for our current shortfall in weapons. As for finances, we're stable, though I expect these new ventures to quickly yield substantial returns. Alex remarked with a casualness that belied the scale of the illicit operation he was discussing. That should not take long. With the new shipping routes we are opening up, we should be able to increase profits in the drug smuggling circles by at least 20%, and that business is always increasing in worth on its own already. A blonde man said with a smirk on his face in response to Alex's last comment. Tim afraid I can't promise the same increase in the money laundering business. We are already in charge of supply, so the only way we can increase profits is if we either up our cut, which I would advise against, or if demand goes up. A bombshell of a woman said next, with a powerless shrug of her bare shoulders. If we're aiming for a significant scale-up beyond that, it would mean taking over more market share, which entails considerable bloodshed and expense, a lean middle-aged man commented, his tone indicating the weight of such a decision. The rest of the table nodded in agreement. We will hold off on taking more market for now. If my deal with the Mandarin works out, we should be able to grab a lot of the Ten Rings market or even take in whole chapters of them into our own fold. There is also a chance that my dealings with him might cause damage to the hand, so be ready to react to that. Alex said as he started to wrap up the meeting. After all, this meeting was of little importance Everything he heard here, he could just as well have read from a report. The only reason he had this meeting arranged was to try out the Godfather experience. Retreating to his favorite spot by the pool, Alex browsed the day's news on his phone. The story of Tony Stark's secret child had receded from the headlines, now occupying only half of page three in the morning paper. On his news app, it had disappeared altogether from the headlines. Seems your fame doesn't carry as much weight without the suit, eh, Tony? Alex mused, leaning back to enjoy a moment of relaxation, contemplating his somewhat playful rivalry with Stark. Chapter 6. Unexpected System Ping Mighty 5. Alex hadn't expected anything interesting to happen until his meeting with Stain. Even then, that was more because of his future as the villain of Iron Man 1 than anything else. That expectation had been dashed when, suddenly, his worthless system pinged him out of nowhere. 
Ding, congratulations to Host for containing yet another SCP. As this is the first SCP that the Foundation has successfully contained without Host, Host is granted a reward. Ding, Host is rewarded with one Foundation Special Combat Unit of 20 Class A Combat Personnel and 100 Class B Combat Personnel. He quickly dismissed the notification and looked at the Foundation database. Sure enough, a new entry had been added by Site-644. Some piece of alien tech? They gave it a safe class classification, so I guess it's not a big deal. At least I don't remember this thing from any of the movies or shows. Not that I ever saw anything but the biggest films. Alex thought and felt a bit depressed at the end, as he regretted not watching more Marvel stuff. Sure, he had watched the big popular films and some recaps of some other stuff with a few theories on YouTube. That still left a lot of blanks given how much they had been pushing out before his transmigration. Shaking his head, Alex dismissed the entry and was about to return to his work when a thought popped up, making him pause. System, did that give me any points? Ding, Host was rewarded with 200 points for the successful containment of the safe class SCP. Thad hoped that would indeed be the case. Now I got next month covered, and I can start putting some more plans into motion. Alex whispered with a slight smile on his lips as he started to make plans for getting his hands on more points by handling Marvel SCPs. The following morning, while Alex perused the newspaper at breakfast, an attendant reminded him, Please remember your lunch meeting with Mr. Stain today, sir. Yes, I remember. Also, send a team to San Juan to investigate a lead on an SCP object beneath the city, Alex replied smoothly, initiating the search for the Cree city. Despite his limited knowledge of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. plots, he felt any intervention would be inconsequential in the grand scheme. Should we construct a containment facility? inquired another subordinate. Hmm, a Class II or III facility might be needed. It might be Euclid or even Keter class and shouldn't be highly dangerous, but containing it could be difficult given its size and location. I will have what I know sent out to whatever team is put in charge. A team will depart within the hour, the subordinate confirmed, exiting to make the necessary arrangements. This will be a good first major challenge for the Foundation, to handle an entire underground city right under a major city without letting S.H.I.E.L.D. know. Alex thought as he finished his breakfast before returning to his bunker to write up the entry. SCP-112555 Pending, Special Containment Procedures, Pending, Description, Believed to be an extensive underground alien facility, possibly Cree, with undetermined defensive capabilities. Recommends using Class D personnel for initial exploration. Addendum, Neural 1, by Order of 051, the use of 1,000 Class D personnel has been approved. After completing the entry, which was sparse in details, Alex reflected on the likelihood of fatalities in exploring the city. To think I've just potentially sentenced a thousand people to death. Transmigration really changes one's perspective, he whispered in the silent room, shaking off the thought to focus on work before meeting Stain. With Obadiah Stain. Obadiah looked at the young man in front of him. His pitch-black suit, short blonde hair, and bright blue eyes made him look like a rich, pretty boy but he knew that this person was nothing like his own Tony. Lonley just started selling weapons to those Ten Rings guys, and then the head of the Ritchie family wants to meet me? I have a bad feeling about this. Obadiah couldn't help but let he's thoughts run wild as he sat before the Alexander overkill Ritchie. Taking a sip of his water to wet his dry mouth, Obadiah gave the man in front of him a weak smile before breaking the silence. So what can I do for you, Mr. Ritchie? Obadiah might act like a big deal in front of others, but he still had to give some respect to the person in front of him. Since starting to sell weapons on the black market a few years back, he had learned a lot of things. For one, he had gotten a whole new respect for Tony's genius. The damn boy might be trouble at times, but he was a goose laying golden eggs. After selling the first few batches of weapons, the military came knocking, not to find him, but to find Tony. They wanted newer, better weapons since their enemies had gotten their hands on the same stuff they used. Another thing he learned was that he had started at a good time, just as the Ten Rings were in the middle of expanding. He also learned a lot about people he had never known before, 
just like Alexander Ritchie here. He might look like a harmless youth, but both of those were lies. How in the world can he continue to look so young? He is older than Tony, if not older than me, Obadiah cursed in his heart. The Ritchie family had been one of the big surprises. He had known of them even before entering the black weapons market. The Ritchie were the number one force to launder money in the States. He had used them before, as had just about everyone that could skim the book enough that they needed to clean money. That was just a new side business started by the current head, this Alexander, in front of him. The Ritchie family had another title, Drug Kings of Europe. At least 80% of all drugs entering that whole continent came there through the Ritchie family, and they were still expanding. Their most concerning title was Overkill. Since while others might send a hitman in the dark, the Ritchie would send a rocket through your office window in broad daylight. Yes, Mr. Stain, I wanted to discuss business with you. The folder, Alex said, and an attendant handed Obadiah a thin folder. You want nuclear weapons? Obadiah couldn't help but exclaim out loudly as he read the file. It read like a shopping list of weapons of doom, as they were all the most dangerous and powerful weapons made by the Stark industry and mankind. Not just buying them either, even just the key components as well? Even a man like Obadiah felt his heart hammering, and his mouth go dry at the idea of a criminal wanting stuff like this not to mention the amounts. That is right, Mr. Stain. I recently got my hands on a few very exclusive business opportunities, yet I find myself unable to complete them on my own, which is where you come in. The young-looking man said smoothly, like he was talking about the weather or something equally mundane and not fucking nukes. Well, Mr. Ritchie, I don't know what to say. You sure know some dangerous people, Obadiah said nervously. Perhaps but also some very wealthy people, Mr. Stain, people that can make us rich just the same if we can get them what they want, the blonde bastard said with a light smile as he leaned back. Even if you say that, getting these things will take a lot of work. One doesn't just misplace a nuclear warhead without attracting all types of attention. He tried to explain, while imagining just who was attempting to get their hands on these weapons through the Ritchie family which is why the option of merely selling some of the parts is there as well. Naturally, the price will be much lower for just the enriched uranium on its own, but Stark does make some powerful alternatives that are acceptable as well. With those words, a long discussion began, which lasted hours before the two men parted ways, both satisfied. Oh, and Mr. Stain, one more thing. I just got my hands on a little something from the Air Force. It is something rather impressive as well. Perhaps, if young Tony finds himself bored, and if you would rather, he didn't go back out to feed those recent rumors. Then perhaps why, Ao could send him my way. He could spend some time helping my men look it over and trying to understand it. Who knows, he might come back home having learned a thing or two. Obadiah was left alone with those words and couldn't help but remember the news about the Air Force pulling some crazy stunts last month. He was now starting to think that it might have something to do with losing whatever it was that had ended up in Richie's hands. Now the question is whether or not it is worth the risk of sending Tony over to that monster. Back with Alexander. Alex sat in the back of his car on the way back home after his meeting with Stain. He knew he had spooked the man by trying to get his hands on so many powerful weapons. Right now, the Foundation just didn't have the ability to make its own nuclear weapons. And what kind of Foundation would he be running if it wasn't able to throw nukes at all its problems? Sure, it wasn't like he didn't have any. Every site had at least one. While more significant sites had more as well, but the amount he could freely use was far too low for his liking. This will put a big drain on the liquid funds available to me, not to mention Ulysses next week. Who would have expected that weapons of mass destruction would be so damn expensive? Alex thought as they neared his mansion. He was also tempted to visit Kingpin, but that could wait. That man was still far from as powerful as he would be in the future, and Alex himself was far more powerful than he had assumed at first. Now let's hope Stain comes through on this entire thing. A few ready-made nukes would make me feel a lot safer for sure. 
Alex thought as he looked out the window at the many houses and manors of other rich people here in New York. Once back home, Alex returned to work right away as there was still a bit of time left before dinner and he was kept busy these days by his many plans. We need more engineers. A lot more. Look into recruiting some good ones. Alex called out to the empty room as he remembered that he had gotten requests from every site for help in building more Quinjets. They really are great crafts, he whispered, as even the drug smuggling operation under him wanted to use the stealth crafts to aid in the rapid expansion. The 50 engineers he had gotten per site wouldn't cut it as all the new sites too requested that treatment. It would be good if Tony were to take me up on my invitation. Those crafts are giving even my people some trouble, and getting a better relationship with Tony before he becomes Iron Man will be useful as well. Alex would deny it until his last breath that the real reason he gave out the invitation was just because he wanted to meet his favorite Avenger. Sir, we just got the word from an agent. Tomorrow, Darren Cross will move to remove Hank Pym from Pym Technologies. One of his guards stepped out and informed him. Damn, I just informed them to keep an eye on Pym yesterday, and we already have what we need. Good thing I remembered that it would happen sometime around now, or I would have lost the chance of getting Pym. Alex thought, relieved, as he desperately needed people at that level, not to mention that he would get a whole family of heroes in the future if he played his cards right. As soon as the vote passes, I want Pym to be given an offer he won't be able to forget. I doubt he will accept anything right away. So don't try to force it. Just make sure that every morning when he remembers he doesn't have to get up for work, he remembers our offer. Alex ordered quickly and waved the guard away as he went back to his bunker so he could plan how to best make use of Pym. Alex couldn't really remember much about Darren Cross and his stupid plans, which would fail due to a criminal in a borrowed supersuit. Whatever it was, it hardly mattered and wouldn't end up succeeding anyway. Depending on what happens in the future, he might just get rid of him and take over the company as part of the foundation. Pym might like that, getting kicked out and then retur, nying in a huge fashion as the big boss under me. Yeah, let's try and see if that is possible, and I need to make a move on AIM as well. I need someone in there to grab some control over the whole thing quickly. Another day ended with Alex sitting in his secret bunker and scheming like a Bond villain. Chapter 7 The Vibranium Deal, The Six Alex was aboard one of the three Quinjets granted to his Site-01 by the system en route to South Africa. His destination, a meeting with the region's most notorious arms dealer, Ulysses Clow. This trip wasn't about acquiring ordinary weapons, which he could easily delegate to a subordinate. Instead, Alex pursued a unique item that Clow had pilfered from some rather secretive individuals. One of his assistants called out, holding out a phone. Sir, a call for you. He couldn't help but raise an eyebrow as he was interrupted from looking over the many reports he had to deal with daily, but still taking the phone. It's me. Sir, I'm the agent in charge of dealing with AIM. I request permission to spend 1 billion USD on securing our objective. The voice on the other end stated directly. A billion dollars. Killian's ambition is costly. He's likely nearing a stable extremist prototype. Alex thought. Though calling it stable might be giving him too much credit given the state it was in doing Iron Man 3. Approved. Ensure we embed at least five of our scientists in the project for that amount, he responded after a brief contemplation. On the other side of the call with Aldrich Killian. Aldrich watched the security footage on his monitor of the hallway right outside his office, where the man had gone to make a call. He was slightly impressed that he couldn't hear anything. Vocal jamming? This is becoming more and more interesting. Barely a moment after the call ended, the man entered the room again. Mr. Killian, my boss has agreed to the amount. He even allowed five of his own scientists to be moved in to help ensure the project succeeds. Aldrich was somewhat surprised at how easily his request for one billion was met. He had been somewhat suspicious when he was informed that some private investor wanted to join AIM, especially so close to the success of Project Extremis. It all felt terribly suspicious, but he also couldn't turn down that amount of money at present. Why, that is great to hear. 
I don't suppose you can tell me who you work for now, can you? As for the scientists, well, I'm sure I can find somewhere for them in AIM, Aldrich said with a smile on his face. While suspicious, he still enjoyed the idea that someone believed so much in him to spend a full billion like that. I'm afraid my boss wishes to remain anonymous for now, Mr. Killian. Now, shall we get to the signing of the agreements? The man smoothly deflected and tried to move the conversation on. Well, this man might be trained enough not to let things slip, but if he really is sending real scientists, there is no way they won't let it slip soon enough. Aldrich thought to himself as they moved on to signing document after document. Aldrich was once again surprised when the person before him signed the transfer for the funds himself rather than needing his mysterious boss to process it. This caused his suspicious to grow and he resolved himself to ensure that those spies didn't reach extremists. Alex was just about ready to meet with the infamous weapons dealer. His men were working on security right now, which for a man like him meant combat helicopters in the air with high-caliber machine guns and tank buster rockets, as well as a fully armed section of Alpha-1 ready to lie down their lives for him. We will be landing in a few minutes, sir. From there, the meeting will be around 100 meters away from the landing point. An Alpha-1 member said as he stood in full-body armor with his gun in hand. While Alex himself was just dressed in his typical suit, which was naturally entirely bulletproof, and his foundation pin on his chest. All right, and remember, we will be getting what we want from this meeting, one way or another, Alex said to remind his men to act appropriately. After all, he didn't want to pay too much, so putting a bit of pressure on Ulysses was expected. The men nodded in understanding as they waited for the craft to land, which happened five minutes later. Afterward, the door opened. All right, let's get some vibranium for the foundation. As Alex stepped outside the craft, he could see his men standing at attention while the sound of his helicopters filled the air and kicked up a strong wind. Not far away, he could see a small group of men dressed very differently from his own guard, standing around and waiting. Mr. Clow, it is a pleasure to meet you. Alex called out as he neared the group, and he could see the man who would one day demand payment from even Ultron. Ah, Mr. Ritchie, you bring quite an escort with you. One would almost think you were going into war with that much firepower. The man said, clearly on edge by being surrounded by that much firepower. Sure, his own men were around with jeeps, machine guns, and shoulder-mounted rockets, but it felt a little underwhelming compared to what the other man brought. No, no, not war, Mr. Clow. I am here for the same reason as you, business. Alex said over the noise of the flying deathbringers in the air. Business, you say? The word on the street is that you are pushing hard for expansion right now. A bad time, I dare say, with the Mandarin doing the same and all. Ulysses knew quite a few things about what was going on in the underworld, so he wasn't surprised that Richie wanted weapons, though he didn't believe he had to come all the way down himself to buy them. Well, you let me worry about that, Mr. Clow. I didn't do this without thinking about it first, I can assure you. Now, on to business. I am looking for something special, something I know you have, something I know you got from your dealings back in the day. Alex said as he used his right hand to tap the back of his neck. The signal wasn't unnoticed by the arms dealer as he tensed up a little. That is some expensive stuff, all right, and very, very rare. Ulysses said slowly while putting an emphasis on just how rare it was. We both know it is nowhere near as rare as those guys claim, I also know just how much of it you really got your hands on, a full quarter, didn't you? Alex said with a toothy grin on his lips. I'm only asking for a mere ten kilograms of it. Ulysses was left very concerned by what he heard the Italian man say. He was just about to open his mouth when all those heavily armed and very well-trained looking men of Richie's all tightened the grip of their weapons, which made him reconsider his words. That will cost you a lot, Mr. Ritchie, and that is with a capital L, he said after a moment. Tam ready to pay you one billion for all of it. Agree, and I promise that no one will hear a word, nor will any of it enter the market either. Alex made his offer. He knew the reason vibranium was usually so damn expensive was that it was believed to be beyond rare. 
yet tons and tons of it were hidden by a particular nation, so the real value was not quite as high as many believed. That is a generous offer, but not even close to its value, Ulysses responded firmly to the low offer. While a billion dollars was a significant sum, selling vibranium at the average market price could potentially yield tens of times that amount. Please, Mr. Clow, we both know it will take quite a few decades, maybe even lifetimes, to offload your stockpile. Unless you want to flood the market and attract unwanted attention, not only from those pains in the neck, but from the rest of the world as well, Alex explained, emphasizing the potential risks. Alex was more than prepared for Ulysses to decline the offer, and more than prepared to make him accept it as well. Ulysses grimaced at the mention of drawing attention from Wakandans. You said that none of this would enter the market, nor would it go to my other buyers? He inquired, swayed by the promise of a billion-dollar payday. That's correct, Mr. Clow. I have my own reasons for wanting this. If you sell me what I want, you won't hear or see of it ever again. And who knows, I might even return to buy more in the future, helping you turn a few rocks into hard cash and lots of it. Alex replied, attempting to sweeten the deal. He knew that a man like Ulysses Clow was not someone who could be easily threatened into anything without wanting to get get back at you. So Alex did his best to ensure Clow would be satisfied. If he couldn't, then he would have to get rough and live up to his name as Overkill. Don't push me, Ulysses. The Foundation wants this ore, and what the Foundation wants, it gets. Handle the payment, and I'll have what you want brought out here within the hour, Ulysses agreed after a moment's consideration. He understood that while he was selling his goods below their market value, the alternative risked drawing unwanted attention. I hope the money can be all clean as well, he added cautiously. We'll clean it for you as an after-sale bonus, just this once, though. That way, we can finish this quickly, and both end the day happy, Alex said after a short pause. He turned around and started walking back to his Quinjet. Oh, and Mr. Clow, if you get your hands on some nuclear stuff, let me know, Alex called out as he walked away, leaving Ulysses to sweat over that announcement. An hour later, Alex sat in his Quinjet and played with a small piece of vibranium as he started the trip back home. T if a bunch of cowards hiding in their jungle and stealing tech from the rest of the world to improve it with this stuff can be considered the most advanced civilization on Earth, then my foundation can make true marvels with it, Alex mused. He was already anticipating what the foundation might be able to do with the vibranium, though he was worried they would want to target Wakanda to get their hands on all of it. Alex himself had no respect for the nation or its people. He knew the Foundation personnel would have even less as they greedily hoarded something that could bring prosperity to all of mankind. Stop by 644. I want to talk with the top research staff there and get me some pictures of Howard Stark's Stark Expo and invite Anton Vanko and his son to a site for an interview on the arc reactor design, Alex instructed. He suddenly remembered that he didn't have to wait for Tony to come around for these things. Tony could make it in a cave from scrap, and Ivan could do pretty much the same, then there is no way my people can't create it on their own, much less with Ivan on board as well, he added with a cold voice, fully informing his men what he meant by invitation. His men didn't understand what he meant by Tony making something in a cave, but neither did they care. They had their orders, and that was enough for them. The Quinjet showcased its impressive specs as it arrived at Site 644 in record time. The site itself was only about 60 kilometers from Paris and was currently his main stronghold in Europe. As his jet landed on the roof of what appeared to be the headquarters of a large media company, he saw a group already waiting to greet him. At the front was a bespectacled woman, appearing to be in her mid-fifties, she had the look of a respectable businesswoman who had seen everything, fitting for her high-ranking position in the Foundation. Welcome to Site 644, sir. 1 a.m. Site Director Alexandra, and I'm pleased to have you here, she said, quickly leading Alex and his guards into the depths of the facility, where a large group of researchers greeted them. Alexandra? That means Defender of Mankind, doesn't it? A fine name indeed, Director, Alex said lightly. 
knowing well about her name as his own meant the same while riding the elevator and offering the woman a light smile. Well, it is what we do, sir. I have sent out one of those new quinjets to bring in that father and son pair you requested. They should get here soon enough. And if I may, those jets are a real marvel, or so my men keep saying. Having more of those would be a blessing, the woman said, making a barely veiled request for more jets. Alex didn't bother answering it, as he simply didn't have more to give. Even S.H.I.E.L.D. was still working on making their first working ones. The rest of the day, Enton with Alex handing over two kilograms of vibranium to the researchers and telling them what he knew about the metal, as well as informing them about Wakanda and Tolokan, which he named as an SCP. He also hinted about the possibility of relics made of the stuff that might have leaked out into museums around the world. He finished by telling them about the high-energy element found by Stark and that the father and son duo would have designs for a reactor that was meant to harness that power. Returning home, he felt like he had accomplished a lot over the past few days, such as buying vibranium, getting into AIM, and obtaining the arc reactor. He looked forward to seeing what his people could do with vibranium, the reactor, and the new element. The staff back at Site 644 had been really excited to get started on it, so he expected some results soon enough. That site might not be one with a focus on science, but that didn't mean that they didn't have a large amount of bright minds around. Alex still hoped to get a proper foundation science research site soon. For the glory of humanity, he said as he stood up and emptied his wine glass before leaving his spot by the pool and heading to bed. Behind him, his men saluted in the shadows and repeated his words. Chapter 8. The Shadow of SCP-1697 Alex barely noticed time slipping by as he plunged into a whirlwind of work. His involvement with the Foundation had escalated to an all-time high as they managed to secure an impressive array of SCPs, a feat that should have been less surprising to him. The legends of curses and hauntings they pursued often bore fruit, leading to unexpected discoveries. Alex had finally gotten his first Euclid SCP placed in containment due to the tireless efforts of the Foundation personnel. Sadly, all he got was 1,000 system points and not any other rewards. Still, it had allowed him not to have to worry about points for the monthly summoning, so he was satisfied enough. This development had an added benefit. The Foundation agents were now thoroughly engaged in meaningful tasks, significantly reducing the number of trivial requests that typically flooded in. However, Alex observed an uptick in requests for interventions in Wakanda, driven by the increasing allure of Vibranium's potential. Amidst this flurry of activity, Alex found himself almost looking forward to the next SCP he would summon, contemplating the rewards it could bring. His attention to SCP-169, the Sleeping Leviathan, had waned since there was little he could do, other than financially support its containment. Not that the system considered it properly contained, after all, all he could do was send some ships down and keep an eye out for anything that might spell trouble. Elsewhere, the giant creature was far from forgotten. Kamartaj. The tranquil atmosphere of Kamartaj had been disrupted ever since the Ancient One began displaying signs of agitation. This unusual behavior had sent ripples of unease throughout the temple, sparking whispered conversations among the masters. My friend, what has everyone acting so tense all the time? A master of the mystic arts who had been away for a time asked a friend. Ah, yeah, you have been busy with the situation in China, haven't you? Well, if you spend any time here now, you will surely notice it. The Ancient One has been spooked, the friend said in a low voice. T saw her in the library when I got here. She seemed so busy I didn't dare to disturb her. The first master said in a low voice of his own. Indeed, she has been acting like that for the past few weeks. At first, no one dared to ask her any questions. It wasn't until Master Cassilis asked her that the rest of us found out what was going on, the other master said in hushed tones. And what did Master Cassilis say had worried the Supreme One? The master asked, filled with curiosity. Well, right after speaking with the Supreme One, Master Cassilis left the temple. He returned, clearly disturbed. It was then the rest of us learned what had happened. You see, it appears that the Ancient One was suddenly alerted to the appearance of a huge life signature. 
When she went to check it out, she discovered an impossibly huge creature sleeping at the bottom of the sea. Which sea? The other master interrupted. Not just one, my dear friend. That is what is so frightening. The creature is so huge it spans from the Atlantic to the Pacific. As I said, the creature is impossibly large in size. There is no way it just appeared. It must have been there for millions of years, but it went unnoticed until a few weeks ago. Now everyone is trying to find out who hid the creature and how they did it, the master said, not letting the interruption bother him. So, this creature has scared everyone? The master asked, clearly not yet understanding the size of the unknown creature. Well, naturally, everyone is worried. As I said, the creature is sleeping, but should it wake up and move just a little bit, it will cause countless amounts of life to be lost, possibly destroying entire continents without meaning to, the master said, trying to help his friend understand the horror of this behemoth. That, that is a scary thought, but it is sleeping, yes? The tone of the first master had now grown more worried and the volume lower. Yes, and I'm sure many masters are looking for ways to ensure it doesn't wake up either, the master said, casting a look towards the library where both the ancient one and most senior masters were buried in old tomes. And here I thought we had enough to worry about with creatures from other dimensions trying to enter into ours. Yet now we also have to deal with something like that. I don't envy the Supreme One. The burden on her shoulders must truly be immense. The two masters continued to discuss it in hushed whispers, and all around the place, other members of Kamartaj did the same. The sudden appearance of SCP-169 had truly made everyone feel worried. Rightfully so as well, since it was a dangerous Keter Class One, which could cause a K-Class event. At the bottom of the sea lay Talokan, a city glittering with a brilliant luster, home to the Talokanil, a near-human species adorned with blue skin and gills. Having long forsaken the surface world, they now reigned supreme under the waves, their resentment towards humans slowly growing as their waters became increasingly polluted. Inside a resplendent building, King Namor engaged in earnest conversation with one of his advisors. The subject of their discourse was evident, observable through the large windows of the chamber. SCP-169, also known as the Leviathan, loomed ominously in their midst, though they would not recognize it by that name. My king, did you learn anything from the surface dwellers? The advisor asked with a tired voice, having been unable to get proper rest since the appearance of the creature. They don't seem to know that it is even there, much less what it is or how it came to be there, Namor replied, his tone fatigued. But my king, this leviathan couldn't simply have appeared out of thin water. Our kingdom has been here for many years. We have ruled the seas for generations, and now our people are afraid to even sleep in their own beds. The advisor exclaimed, desperately seeking answers. Don't you think I know that? But it really seems like it appeared out of thin water. Look at its size, then look at our city. Our home should be in ruins from the displacement of water caused by that thing appearing the surface should be destroyed by rising sea levels. Yet, neither of those things happened. Namor countered, his weariness evident. But what should we do, my king? The beast can't be allowed to stay there. We wouldn't be able to rest easy with it so close to us, the advisor implored. Nothing. We will do nothing because we can't do anything. The creature is sleeping right now, and it's the only reason our kingdom is still intact. Should it wake up and move, we would be doomed. No, we have ruled the seas for a long time. Now we must simply accept that we are not its true masters, Namor declared, his voice filling the chamber with resolve. But what of the people? What do we tell them? They are worried. They can't rest or stay calm. The whole kingdom is in chaos even as we speak, the advisor protested, his voice shaking. Tell them that it is a new guardian god of our kingdom. Tell them that it will do us no harm as long as we don't disturb its sleep and let us pray it never wakes up, and let's continue to monitor the area around it to see if it has any harmful effects on the ocean, Namor instructed after a long pause and with a heavy heart. Yes, my king. To know you don't like the answer, but the truth is that we have no answer, and we have no solution, Namor conceded. He liked it no more than his advisor did, but he truly had nothing more to offer. 
Even if his power to control sea life worked on it, the creature only needed a single moment while awake to move its body, and his kingdom would be gone. He didn't dare gamble on his voice working before that happened, never mind if his voice had no effect. For now, it was sleeping, so let it sleep and hope it never wakes up. The one-eyed pirate and the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury, stood in his office with one of his most trusted age, Entz, Maria Hill. What is this I have heard about some sea routes being closed off, he asked. Well, sir, it seems to be a non-profit organization called the Nature Preservation Foundation. They have declared that some rare and unique type of ocean ecosystem there is threatened. They have used huge amounts of money to push for the area to be spared just about any type of human intervention. Shipping lanes, military routes, and everything else have been kept out, all with the power of money and public support from other organizations like Greenpeace. And what is the truth? Nick Fury wasn't stupid enough to think that something like some stupid underwater seaweed would be able to raise enough money and political power to get a blockade of this size to happen unless there was some secret behind it. The truth, sir, seems to be that the Ritchie family is using the whole thing as another way to launder money and protect a shipping route for drugs. As some ships still travel the area, and those are all Ritchie ships, Hill said, having already made sure to find out the whole truth before coming to report anything to her boss. Hmm. The Ritchie family seems to be working hard on expanding, very hard indeed. This is already the eighth time I've heard that name this week. Do we know why? Fury said, pondering all he knew about this crime family. We are not entirely sure yet, boss. They are so active that our spies are having trouble keeping up, but they seem to be trying hard to get in touch with the Ten Rings. So it seems that it has something to do with them, Hill said, a bit more unsure, as there were still a lot of questions surrounding the Ricky family's recent actions. Hmm. Keep an eye on them, then. No mollies. We can ignore their drug smuggling and money laundering since they have so much support from above. But if they start working with terrorists, we might have to get involved, Fury said after a moment, countless plans for dealing with the Ritchie family flashing through his mind momentarily before letting it drop. Yes, sir. I will have our men keep an eye out for anything and figure out what they want with the Ten Rings, Hill said as she finished up her report and put the matter in the back of her mind, deeming it mostly unimportant. Site 001 While the world slowly reacted to his actions, Alex himself sat in his bunker, adding names to the long list of people and organizations he wanted to keep an eye on at all times. Joseph and Lucy Bauer, Bruce Banner, Peter Parker, Norman Osborn, Morgan Le Fay, Pride, Agatha Harkness, Dr. Stephen Vincent Strange, Wanda Maximoff, Daniel Whitehall, a.k.a. Werner Reinhardt, Natasha Romanoff, Anthony Edward Stark, Kevin Thompson, Jessica Jones, Mark Spector, Arthur Harrow, Helen Cho, Cersei, Gilgamesh, Ajak, Icarus, Thena, Kingo, Spite, Fastos, Makari, Druig. The list was filled with names that Alex remembered from before his move into this world, though many of those names he had little idea of who there truly was. He knew that some of them was connected to the Darkhold, which was enough to earn his attention. Other names were added simply so he could stay updated on important events. Norman Osborn had been a rather unpleasant surprise, as it wasn't one he had expected to see in this world. Yet clearly there was some differences between this world and the canon MCU. What these differences was, he didn't know. However, it did mean he had to be on guard for the unexpected. Still, the list before him was filled with people who could come across an SCP or were SCPs themselves. If he acted in time, he could prevent quite a few near XK-class events without relying on some contrived plot to save the day. Furthermore, many of them could potentially be valuable assets for him and the Foundation without alerting the Ancient One. He truly desired to acquire the Tesseract, but feared that doing so would draw her wrath upon him. Additionally, he wanted to ensure he could contain it in a way that Loki wouldn't be able to manipulate it. For now, he focused on smaller tasks. However, as he looked at the list, he couldn't help but mourn the time he would have to spend writing up SCP files for many of them. Far too many were simply too dangerous to confront without any knowledge of their abilities, and he didn't want to risk either sacrificing his agents 
or alerting the anomalies. Chapter 9, The Mandarin, Finally 8. Now I know that in the film, Wen Wu mocks the name he was given by the West. He does, however, use that in the comics, so the using of that name is part of my AU. After far too long, Alex finally had a chance to speak with SCP-1000. The Mandarin, Su Wen Wu himself. Alex had been just about ready to send one of the Foundation's valuable nukes down at him to get his attention. Alex, as the leader of the Foundation, had gotten used to being in charge over the past two months. Waiting weeks to talk with someone didn't make him happy at all. Even more so when all he got was a damned phone call with him as well. The Mandarin, it sure has been difficult to get a chance to talk with you, Mr. Shu. Alex said as the phone connected while leaning back in his office at Site-001. Mr. Ritchie, your persistent efforts to reach me have been noted, Shu's voice came through, devoid of humor. I am occupied these days. Be direct and do not squander my time. Fine, Mr. Shu, if that is what you want. I wanted to speak with you about your return and the revival of the Ten Rings. I was of the understanding that you had retired to be with your family. Alex said slowly while tapping his fingers against his desk. Don't bring up my family, Shu hissed angrily on the other side of the phone. If you must know, then I am out for revenge. As long as you don't get in my way, Richie, then we will have no problems. Revenge? Who in this world is foolish enough to cross you of all people so badly you would come out of retirement? Alex pretended that he knew nothing, and while he indeed didn't remember who killed his wife, he at least knew it had happened. If you must know, Mr. Ritchie, then someone dared to kill my beloved wife and one will not rest until I have had my revenge. Shu snapped back angrily. Alex glanced down at his desk, where the files for SCP-1252 and, and SCP-1254 lay in two small paper folders. He had planned to sell these to Shu, but since the man didn't even want to meet him face to face, Alex decided to raise the price a bit. Allow me to offer my condolences for your wife's passing, Mr. Shu. I only ever met her once, but that was enough for me to know she was a truly good person. Alex started his final plan with those words. T would like to offer my help, but alas, while I can do much to prevent someone from dying, bringing them back is beyond what I can do. He continued smoothly. Why are you suddenly talking about bringing my wife back? I just said I wanted revenge. Even if she were brought back, I would not stop, Sue asked, his voice edged with suspicion. Well, you keep saying you want revenge, and if someone took something from me, well, let's just say my revenge would not be complete before I stood with what they took back in my arms and them all lying dead and broken before me, Alex replied, leading Shu down a different path than he had walked in his movie. So, what would the famous Overkill do if someone killed the love of your life? Shu asked, now somewhat calmed down. Well, I think the only proper revenge is when you lose nothing and they lose everything. So, I guess I would find a way to bring my love back to me. While most would think something like that impossible, they would also think an ancient warlord still being alive today as impossible, but we both know better. Alex continued to string him along, now that he had him hooked. You know something, Richie. I can hear it in your voice. The Mandarin shot back. T didn't lie when I said I didn't have a way to bring someone back. But I hear things, rumors, and the like. There are two rumors I have heard that might be able to give you what you want, he said, cleanly loading his words with hints. Not mere rumors, I would assume, since you dare bring it up with me. What do you want for this information you have, Mr. Ritchie? The Mandarin said as he bit down on the bait willingly. From there, the conversation went on and on as they started talking business, and Alex did his best to balance his greed with shrewdness. S. Till, when he finally put the phone down hours later, he had gotten a lot from the old warlord. With this, China will more or less be mine. The Foundation should be able to replace S.H.I.E.L.D. there rather quickly. Now I just need to wait and pretend I'm looking into those clues for a bit longer, and then I can meet him for a handover, Alex thought as he placed the files inside a safe and left to have some dinner. Tomorrow, I will summon yet another SCP. Maybe I should look up some lucky rituals? Nah, given my luck, some SCP will be involved with that, and my ritual would just mean I would summon them tomorrow. Alex walked with a spring in his step, 
as he was both excited and terrified about what could happen tomorrow. System, summon the monthly required SCP to meet the minimum, Alex said as he sat in his bunker right after having finished his breakfast. Ding, understood host, please stand by as the random SCP is summoned. Ding warning, host and SCP has appeared in the world and is outside Foundation control. Host is asked to deal with the situation and follow the Foundation's goal of securing, containing, and protecting. Warning, SCP-1555 has appeared. Hmm. All right, this one is doable, I guess. However, again, it is not something that can be placed in a containment cell, so it will be interesting to see if just putting up some signs and a fence or two will be enough. Alex thought after going over the information he had on this SCP object though I guess I can use this SCP for a few of my plans. Alex whispered as he leaned back to make plans before his system once again interrupted him. Ding, congratulations, host. For meeting the SCP requirement for three months in a row, host has been rewarded with an additional SCP-free random spawn from the system. Wait, wait, no, no, I don't need that reward. Alex tried to stop his system, but it didn't listen. Ding. Warning. SCP-391 has appeared. Alex nearly collapsed in relief when he learned that it was a safe class SCP that had been summoned. Letting go of the breath he didn't know he had been holding, he used his system to locate the two rogue SCPs while the system went on about rewards. Ding, congratulations to host for getting Site-130, a Class 3 Foundation facility in Russia. 500 Class C combat personnel, 50 research personnel, 100 administrative personnel, and 30 maintenance personnel. Ding. Congratulations to host for getting 1,000 undercover Foundation agents within the USA. Ding. Congratulations to host for getting one special containment task force of 25 Class A combat personnel. Hmm. More undercover agents are nice, but I need way more than that. Still, to think SCP-391 would end up there. Guess I better send someone to get it quickly. He decided and quickly gave the orders for someone to move to Camp Lehigh to follow up on a clue about a possible SCP object there. He figured he could just send them to capture all owls in the area alive, and then they could take their time. Now for SCP-1555, I should get that done before looking into meeting Bruce. It's time I collect my first Avenger. Alex whispered to himself as he could finally start his plan to make his own Alpha-9 strike force within the Foundation. If only that darn SCP locator tool would work. I mean, really, what is the point of telling me that 1555 is in the US? Where else would it be? Alex cursed in his mind how evil his system was. Not only did it suddenly come out and double the chance for a death SCP to spawn, but it gave nearly no help. It was two days later, during one of his daily meetings, that Alex heard the ping of the system ring out in his mind. Ding! Congratulations to host for the successful containment of SCP-391. Rewards are being given out. Ding! Host has been rewarded with Midas Touch 1 half. Please continue to work for the Foundation. Alex couldn't help but raise an eyebrow at that reward. Half of Midas Touch? What is that? System, explain the reward, he whispered under his breath. Ding! Midas Touch allows host to turn O, objects he is touching into gold. Host only has half of the Midas's touch, and therefore can't transform anything to gold yet. So a totally pointless reward which has no use. Great. These rewards make no sense yet. So far, I have only gotten more additions to the Foundation, and now it's personal power? Though I got to admit, the full reward would be sweet. Alex really did like the idea of getting his hands on his first superpower, However, having half didn't do him any good. I guess I need another Midas SCP for the whole reward? Is there even such an SCP? The meeting is over. I want a report on Banner and a trip made ready to San Juan for any time I need it. Alex said, cutting the meeting short as he turned and left the room, leaving behind the sounds of people saluting and crying out. Yes, sir. Welcome to Site 0114, sir, the site director said as Alex stepped off the Quinjet. Thope I didn't take you away from your work, Director. Alex replied politely as he was led inside what looked like a large office building with its very own warehouse next to it. Only the warehouse was, in fact, the vehicle bay. So tell me about this new safe class SCP you have, Director, Alex said as they walked along the halls of the site while nodding to the many members of staff. Well, so far, 
we believe that it's SCP-391, also known as Midas's Owl, which I assume you already had guessed, based on the fact you asked us to capture all owls in the area, the woman said as she led Alex down to a containment cell. Indeed, my sources did suspect that it was SCP-391 that had made a reappearance. Still, given the situation we are in, it's best to be extra cautious. Now, did retrieving 391 come with any difficulties? With the area it showed up in being watched by S.H.I.E.L.D.'s Hydra Division? Not as much as we had feared, sir. We got some proper paperwork done, which should allow us in, and I suspect they didn't want to make a show out of refusing us. They did demand to watch our men do their work, but that was no problem, the woman said as they stood before a large glass window into the containment cell. That's good. We wouldn't want S.H.I.E.L.D. to get in the way of the Foundation's work. While they try to protect humanity in their own way, they can't be trusted with something so important. Only we can, Alex said, not forgetting to enhance the glory of his Foundation in the minds of the other people in the room. Right, you are, sir. They have their own thoughts and ideas. They are not suited to handle SCP cases like we do. The woman agreed, as she knew a lot about S.H.I.E.L.D. as a Class Four employee of the Foundation. The more she knew about them, the less she liked the organization that pretended to be like their Foundation. But enough about that. Instead, I want to talk about 391. I want you to figure out how much gold it can produce and its worth. You are then to sell it through agents within the Ritchie family. The proceeds will be added to this site, though it won't reduce the funds granted from headquarters. Still, it is important to keep the accounts clean and clear. Understood? Alex said after thinking for a moment. He knew that the amount of gold would not be that much. So, there was no point in taking the SCP object back to Site-001. Better to just let it stay here and increase the money this site had so he wouldn't need to increase the budget too much as they got hold of more SCPs. The director naturally agreed as she didn't have a choice and wouldn't go about turning down extra funds as even though there weren't yet many SCPs in containment, the hunt for them still cost a lot of money. After spending the rest of the day at Site-0114, Alex bid farewell and returned back to his home to rest. Tomorrow, we will set off for San Juan, he told his guards so they could prepare everything as he entered his quarters for the night. While Alexander Ritchie was having a meeting with the staff at Site-0114, another Alexander was hearing a report that had quite a few similarities with the one Alex heard. So someone wanted to poke a row und at Camp Lehigh. Alexander Pierce asked on the phone. He, as the head of Hydra, knew that while most of S.H.I.E.L.D. had mostly abandoned the place, Hydra still had some secrets buried there. Yes, sir. It was animal control, sir. They had the proper paperwork to get access to the place, so we couldn't stop them without a good reason. Even then, it would surely have raised questions about why we cared so much for what is supposed to be an abandoned site, the agent on the other end of the call said. We were able to shadow them as they worked on capturing all owls they could find. They did spend a bit of time looking at the bottom of trees for traces of more owls, but did nothing suspicious. It seemed that it was just a legit search for owls without anything else. Hmm, well done for keeping this under wraps for now. I expect you to follow up and ensure nothing else was done or left behind by them. As long as you find nothing, then don't bother reporting it, Pierce said after a short pause as he came to the conclusion that nothing was off about it, given the order to capture owls was legit and apparently because there were signs of bird flu. Understood, sir. Hail Hydra. Hail Hydra. Chapter 10. Inhuman Clue 9. It was a beautiful morning in New York. People were going about their business and hurrying to work and school all around. The city was buzzing with sound and life. Truly, this place was the beating heart of the modern world. In the affluent area of town, nestled within a grand mansion, lived a young, handsome Italian man. The mansion was abuzz with activity, including the distinct sound of a sleek, black, high-tech stealth jet taking off. Their destination was San Juan, where Alex intended to oversee containment efforts for a significant SCP. This endeavor piqued Alex's interest, as containing such a dangerous anomaly in total secrecy presented a formidable challenge. As they touched down, Alex was escorted to an unassuming house that had been converted into a Class II facility. 
Welcome to the temporary Site 2555, sir, the man in charge said as Alex stepped foot into the building. The SCP here is dangerous, sir. Due to this, there are certain precautions you need to be made aware of. First, you are not allowed to enter into SCP-12555 yourself. It is simply too dangerous. The man said both towards Alex and his guards, who all nodded. Secondly, only Foundation personnel with a security clearance of level 2 or lower are permitted near SCP-12555. And thirdly, no advanced Foundation equipment is allowed inside. The man explained, leading them to a room filled with monitoring equipment and diagrams. As you're likely aware, SCP-1255 is an underground city of unknown origin exhibiting anomalous properties. Given its underwater location and limited entry points, gaining access to the city was challenging. However, by using powerful drilling equipment, we were able to create an entrance. Alex examined the maps and pictures displayed during the briefing, nodding slowly as he absorbed the information. He harbored a keen interest in understanding the inner workings of the Foundation. While he could access the finished product through the database provided by the system, he also desired insight into the process leading to that point. After establishing entry, our primary focus was on securing the object and mapping out the interior. This task presented challenges, particularly due to the large size of the object meaning that it's entirely possible that other entrances exist, the man continued. Alex was well aware of the potential difficulties with this SCP object. After all, not only was the size and scale massive, but so too did it just happen to sit under a city, meaning that all work had to be done in total secrecy. Once more, Alex was reminded of the critical need for additional undercover agents. Do I truly need to recruit agents independently? Acquiring the allegiance of low-level individuals will undoubtedly be costly. Training high-level operatives from the ground up seems inevitable. The temptation to summon more SCPs to bolster Foundation personnel grew within him once again. However, he recognized the inherent risks associated with such actions. Some SCP objects might require more personnel than he could secure through summoning, not to mention the inherent dangers involved. After establishing the outer perimeter, we arranged for the shipment of equipment and personnel, including a contingent of Class D personnel, generously permitted for our use. Our initial efforts involved deploying probes and surveillance equipment into the area, the man concluded. All attempts using electronic equipment proved futile, as the SCP interfered with all such devices, the man explained, presenting a detailed list of tests and equipment used in those failed attempts. Subsequently, we had to rely on Class D personnel, which presented additional challenges since we couldn't utilize remote-controlled explosive collars for control. Nonetheless, we adapted, resorting to firearms, which proved effective, he continued, a slight smirk playing on his lips. Alex couldn't help but think that such an approach was dangerous. After all, unless they sent in guards armed with those guns, the on, a way they could have used them, was from the top of the entrance. Should there be another exit somewhere, it was entirely possible that the D-Class would be able to escape with knowledge of the Foundation. Yet he didn't interrupt, willing to find out the details before taking any actions himself. The initial group of Class D subjects we sent in didn't last long. Within moments, we heard loud screams and promptly retrieved them from the hole. He pointed to a monitor displaying a large, deep cavity sealed with a thick steel lid. Of the initial five, three became unresponsive, screaming as if in extreme agony. After a brief period, the screams ceased, and their eyes turned a deep red, the man explained, displaying images of individuals clad in the classic orange jumpsuits with crimson eyes. Following the cessation of their screams, they became aggressive and unresponsive. We classified these as SCP-2555-1. These individuals appeared to have lost their sanity while gaining heightened strength and endurance. We are currently investigating the extent of these enhancements, he elaborated, handing over a file containing documentation of what could only be described as inhumane experiments for Alex to review. We dispatched several instances of SCP-12555-1 to Site-14, the facility overseeing operations here. Fortunately, the remaining two Class D personnel 
helped us establish a correlation between contact with SCP-1255's interior and the transformation into SCP-1255-1 instances. Five additional Class D personnel were lost in verifying this correlation, he continued, detailing the process further. Alex made note of the distance between this location and Site-014, highlighting the lack of facilities in the area. After any level of contact with SCP-12555, ranging from a fingertip to exposure of over 30% of the body, subjects experienced intense pain lasting precisely one minute and 27 seconds before undergoing a complete transformation, the man concluded, leaving Alex increasingly impressed with the Foundation's meticulous approach to containment. All instances were subsequently terminated and transferred to Site-014 for further analysis. Following this, a new group of D-Class personnel was dispatched to map and explore the area. The man continued, presenting a series of maps to Alex, some of which were rudimentary, while others showed significant improvement. T took considerable time to fully explore the entire exterior, and we installed chemically powered lights to illuminate the structure. We also delineated it into an outer and inner section. However, exploring the inner portion proved challenging as all D-Class personnel perished upon crossing the threshold, he explained, acknowledging the limitations faced. While we cannot claim to have entirely mapped the outer region due to certain areas remaining submerged, we are reasonably confident in our understanding of the general layout, he added. Now, regarding the inner area, our inability to deploy personnel or remote-controlled equipment limited our exploration. Instead, we resorted to throwing flares and utilizing binoculars for observation. The inner chamber comprises a single large room with a central semi-structure featuring a raised platform or altar, which appears to be empty, he described, outlining their efforts to study the site despite the challenges. Given the constraints, we redirected our attention to studying the outer area comprehensively and delving into the mechanics behind SCP-1255-1 instances. We allowed for the formation of an additional three instances using D-Class personnel, leaving them within the structure for observation, he concluded, highlighting their adaptive approach to research and containment. They would stand still or move to patrol the area. We believe they are turning into a form of guards for SCP-12555. They will attack anyone entering unless they begin the transformation. Alex nodded along as he listened carefully while looking at the provided material in the form of pictures and video taken from outside the SCP, showing the area immediately inside the opening. Now, one of the most interesting finds we had during this period of testing was that a single member of D-Class was not attacked by instances of SCP-12555-1, he said, sliding a folder containing the information about this D-Class, a Mexican woman who kidnapped children and sold them off. Furthermore, this D-Class had the ability to order the instances around to a limited degree. She did attempt to use this to escape Foundation control, but we dealt with all the SCP-12555-1 instances and moved to confine the D-Class, now assigned as SCP-12555-2. We didn't want to risk her by using her to check if she could enter the inner part. Instead, we sent her to Site-14, for a thorough examination to find out what made her unique. Results on that are currently pending. So we are currently waiting for that report before we continue with tests. If possible, we would next try to identify more instances of SCP-12555-2 to test out if they can enter the inner part. Alex leaned back and nodded his head as the report came to an end. He knew that the woman must have the inhuman gene, which is why that happened. He was also both surprised and happy that an inhuman had been found doing this, since it would push the research further along. How close are we to being able to declare this SCP contained? I'm prepared to allow for a Class II site to be built here in San Juan, even a Class III if needed. With the SCP object seemingly being this dangerous and being so close to a major population center, I want this dealt with properly, Alex finally said after a short pause to think. Well, that depends on a few things, sir. The results of the tests done on the one member of D-Class. We also don't know if there are any clues out there leading to the location of SCP-12555 that others might follow. A Class II facility 
should do for now. As long as the results are not too dire, we should be able to have the SCP declared as contained Euclid class in a month. Alex could accept that time frame and promise to authorize the needed equipment and manpower to be transferred over and for Site-2555 to become operational. Though he might assign a different number for the permanent site, Alex would have liked to spend the rest of the week in San Juan, seeing the sites and having a short vacation, but he simply had too much work to do to be able to do it. Just coming all the way down here to see the Cree city in person and get the report in person had been a frivolous use of time, yet one he had willingly accepted due to his own desires. Still, he did know that he couldn't continue acting like that for now. So, with that being the case, he quickly returned back home as soon as his meeting was over. Back home in New York, he took the chance to set up a few meetings. One was with Norman Osborne, and the other was with Tony Stark. With Tony, all he could do was send a message proposing a challenge to the genius, hoping he would accept. Alex desired a way to bring technologies down into the Cree city, so he needed some kind of shielding. He presented it to them as a unique underground chamber where the metallic composition of the walls would create an EMP field when introduced to a current. Such shielding could come in handy in many cases, he mused. And I remember that many smart people would come out of Oscorp, so getting a chance to recruit them might be good as well. Not to mention more advanced tech is needed in the future as more SCPs come over. He spent most of his time either working on the Ritchie family or the Foundation. When not, he would plan for the future. It was easy to get ahead of himself, and he often had to slow down. Acting too fast could be dangerous. S.H.I.E.L.D. is out there and watching. Plans had been drawn up and scrapped again and again as the timing was off, or the objective would be more successful if he waited longer. There were so many people he wanted to meet and bring into the Foundation, Yet doing so was damn difficult, since they were all occupied with other endeavors under the watchful eye of S.H.I.E.L.D. or simply hesitant to join a shady super-organization. Still, he refused to believe that the nearly almighty foundation, which could acquire and contain gods, couldn't recruit a few arrogant scientists and researchers as well. It was all a matter of time, and having enough SCPs in containment that he could use to demonstrate the value the Foundation brought to humanity would be helpful. Still, SCP-1555 should be enough to persuade Banner to come on board. He wouldn't need much proof, as long as I promise him a better life than he has now, which should be easy since he is on the run and offer him a chance to work on curing the Hulk. Though I need him to fail there, the Hulk is important for the future. Yeah. The Hulk will remain, but I can bring him and Banner closer so we won't have problems. Not to mention, it should count as at least an Euclid-class SCP being contained. Alex mused to himself as he slowly left his bunker after finishing his work. Poor Bruce Banner had no idea that his already chaotic life would soon undergo a huge change as a new person schemed to get his hands on him.